Uh, this is really an epic journey of humanity because for the first time in the history of mankind, we have the knowledge, both engineering, scientific, and business knowledge to be able to start reaching to the stars for many of the things that human beings need uh, to be effective and to be happy. And uh, so to be on this journey and to be the activists, if you will, helping people understand what this can mean is just a joy. And uh, that's why I am so grateful to be a part of this. And there are innovation patents that are waiting to come to market to create that next billion or trillion dollar economy. And we need to look for that workforce where we may have not thought of them in the inner cities, in rural communities, minorities, women, veterans, retirees. We have the workforce we need for the space economy. We just have to reach out and let them know that they can be part of this community. What we want for Mars Point for every, it to be democratic, for anyone to be able to mine it. And so it's very easy to get a hold of one of these. Uh, this is called a future bit Apollo, uh, Moonlander 2 USB key. But there's a lot of wide variety of ASIC hardware that's available. And we're even talking about uh, making our algorithm even easier so you can mine it on a, on a, a smartphone or a computer. Space and some other niche markets we found gave us the ability to make revenue, bring in some business to show we can execute, to also mature manufacturing so we know what the yields look like and the, st the stats. There is a misunderstanding that just because we are talking about space is all about wonderful cooperation. That is what we aspire for and we hope for. But if you look at the programs, for example, uh, China and Russia space program, Turkey, for example, uh, India to an extent as well, these are very nationalistic space programs. Yeah. And so China, what it has very cleverly done is that it has actually established a Belt and Road Space Information Corridor in the last few years. And this is President Xi's thinking in terms of institutionalizing the Communist Party of China. Andy talks about risk in a couple different ways. I've been... <laughs> <laughs> that's my car. <laughs> Go on. Oh my God, that's epic. Uh, it's still wrong, but it's, it's epic. <laughs> Space Force TM, a uh, trademark for Netflix, I think is a damn funny show. Your character is played by John Malkovich. Like, that guy is you. Who has a much better oratory style and a much better word robe than I do, by the way. <laughs> Um, and to me, when when we're ready to use a certain technology, a certain thing, not just for solving problems, but also for the expression of our very being and, and who we are, I, I think that's one of the markers that that technology has arrived. Like it, it's now something that helps us talk about who we are, not just solve the problems we have. The big money maker is probably in the near term going to be uh, the, the backlog of space tourism that we're seeing. And so this is nothing to do with a government program. This is commercial companies making commercial, you know, doing commerce in, in the private sector, which has been um, really looked down upon in the news. But um, I think it's kind of exciting. This is our opportunity to, to build a future where we take this journey into the economy of space and do it responsibly as a human race. I think we can get there, but I think we got to be smarter than we were in the past. And this is where we want to get to. This is what the next plaque needs to say instead of we came in peace for all mankind. <laughs> we came in profit for all mankind. Good morning, y'all. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us this morning. Um, for me, on the west coast of the United States, it's six a.m., so it's uh, uh, always always an early start for me. But uh, for those that are here, thank you very much. We're really grateful. Um, uh, 
yes, we're aware of some technical glitches yesterday. So uh, sorry for the for, sorry for the uh, headache and hassle on that. Um, the uh, links for today and for yesterday will be available on our uh, on our YouTube channel. Um, youtube.com slash liftpoint. I'll post that in the chat here in a little while. Because um, we want to make sure everybody catches everything. So um, yeah, so that's where we are. We're starting out this morning um, uh, to recap a little bit about yesterday. It was terrific. Uh, so if you did miss it, I'm going to encourage that you uh, that you go catch the uh, the show yesterday it was, I think it was pretty amazing uh, to have both the, um, the founder of the Mars Society, uh, Dr. Subrin, the um, director of the Mars Desert Research Station, Dr. Rupert, and the executive director of the Mars Society, uh, James Burke. Between the three of them and, and the other guests that were also uh, quite amazing, um, Mark and Jen and Anastasia. Uh, it was just a really interesting show. And, and um, we're definitely going to do more things like that. Uh, to my knowledge, the MDRS has never been covered um, in, this, in the way that we did it yesterday. So uh, I'm really excited about that. There was some really cool stuff. I took, I took pages and pages of notes. Um, during that, during that conversation. I probably took 10, 12, 15 pages worth of notes yesterday. Um, because as I, as I had told James when we were establishing this program yesterday, uh, this was new content for me. I mean, even though I've been in the space industry for 20 years and I've visited the Mars Desert Research Station twice, uh, but not as a not as an analog astronaut, only as a uh, an outside observer. I called myself a tourist yesterday, and they all they all laughed at me for that. Uh, but it was it was fun. It was a really cool day, um, and you know, getting the insights from the folks that had actually been boots on the ground in this location uh, of what it takes to be that kind of analog astronaut and then how do you apply that to being a real life in the world and in other worlds astronaut um so i thought if so it's worth taking notes on that um, um mark levesque and anastasia stepanova and uh jin sing sai uh they had really good points on a how to how to um, you know be a participant in one of these experiments, but then also you know how to be a better human uh, in the world, right? So uh, there were some there were some really profound life lessons. Um, as one of the speakers talked yesterday about um, you know old goats and millennials, there were lessons from both both uh you know age groups it was it was pretty it was pretty clever it was well done i was very happy with it yesterday and then after speaking with uh james burke after the event uh, you know he was he was pretty pleased um i do have to make a couple caveats today that uh, we do have one one more um mdrs speaker uh that couldn't make the lineup yesterday but the stuff we're going to talk about today is not, not, it does not have very much to do with the Mars Society nor the, nor the Mars Desert Research Station. Um, we're going to talk about something that is somewhat controversial. I think it's a vitally important conversation. I'll, I'll share my opinions on that later during the program. We're going to talk about how to have babies in space, how to bring families to other worlds. And I know that we're a long ways away from that. We're going to talk about that. But uh, there's some controversy to it. So I don't want to I don't want to like give the wrong impression that this is, um, uh, you know, quote unquote, sponsored or sanctioned by the Mars Society. Most of their content was yesterday. And this is this is independent content. 
Um, but I think it's pretty important. And, and um, uh, Dr. Ed, Egbert Edelbrook uh, has joined us on this program uh, four or five times now, three or four times now. Um, and I consider, I consider whenever we go back to the moon, when we eventually go to Mars, uh, even living on the International Space Station for 20 years continuously, I refer to that as camping in space because in all of those cases, we go and come back, we go and come back, we go and come back. And unless we figure out how to have children out on the International Space Station or probably never on ISS, but in a privately commercially run uh, program on the space station, unless we figure out how to do that on the moon, unless we figure out how to do that on Mars, we will only ever be camping in space. We don't, we don't even have an opportunity to create a settlement or a second civilization uh, we don't even have an opportunity to do that unless we figure out what I consider the holy grail of space, which is having children on orbit. So we're going to talk about that a lot today. And then uh, we're bringing in two more folks to talk about analogs. Uh, one, uh, Terry Torino is going to talk about a lunar analog, which I think is certainly important. We, it doesn't get the same amount of visibility as Mars research, or Mars analogs. But you know what? We're going to the moon way, way, way sooner than we're going to Mars as, as a species, not robots. Robots are already there. Um, so I think that lunar analogs should be more popular than they are. They should be more um, uh, visible than they are. Uh, so I want to make sure that we highlight some of that. So that's, uh, that's kind of an introduction for today and a little bit of a, a recap from yesterday. Um, I want to make sure that we acknowledge our, uh, our support from the Mars Society. Um, we've probably had, well, this 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 event, you know, this weekend uh, being a, being an exception, I think we had seven participants from the Mars Society all total, and then they've been involved with a couple of our other programs. So I probably have had Mars Society represented on um, three of our events so far. Obviously, yesterday and today being the most significant, but they've been a really great supporter. I just want to say a shout out to all of them. We are live streaming to, to our channel, to Liftport, uh, youtube.com slash Liftport, but we're also live streaming to the Mars Society channel at, um, uh, on YouTube as well. Uh, so they've been a really terrific sponsor and we really, well, sponsor is wrong, the wrong word, but supporter, supporter. Because, um, uh, you know, we're all space nerds. We're all trying to get out there. So uh, they've been they've been really terrific. Uh, so we really want to acknowledge them um, and the Center for Space Commerce and Finance has been helpful, and uh, uh, the science fiction community of Axonar on YouTube. Axonar um, uh, is a uh, is a short film. It's a fan film. Uh, set in the Star Trek universe. It's super fun. Definitely check that out. Um, so we've had some we've had some support from a couple different organizations. Uh, the National Space Society has been really helpful. Um, I guess we got our uh, uh, initial support from the um, from the Foundation for the Future. International Space University has been involved. The Chief Scientist of US Space Force has been involved. So as we've grown this channel, as we've grown this um, experience, we made some changes internally. Uh, we were originally, well, the company is still Liftport Group. We were originally around to uh, work to develop 
for first the Earth's space elevator, and then over time we shifted gears and evolved to focus on constructing the lunar space elevator. Um, and then during the pandemic, uh, we had to pivot a lot just to stay in in, in business and stay uh, stay alive. So we started doing these conference um, conferences as a service. Uh, and now I think we're up to number 24 or 25. I've actually lost count. I'm going to have to look at that. But 24 or 25 events over the last maybe 18 months or so. Uh, and it's been really terrific. It's really been great. Um, we have three events this month. Um, that's, the, that's the biggest, that's the heaviest schedule we've had so far. Um, this living in space content. We've got another one on... Um, July 20th and 23rd to celebrate the uh, uh, landing on the moon, July 20th, 1969. Uh, so the Moon Society is hosting an event. Uh, well, we're hosting an event for the Moon Society called the Lunar Development Conference. You can check them out at themoonsociety.org. And then um, uh, uh, a cryptocurrency project called Mars Coin contacted us to host an event for them. That's a really intriguing program. So that's marscoin.org. And again, I'll post all these links here in a little bit. Um, so why are we doing this? Well, ultimately building an elevator on the moon is expensive and we need to have a new consistent independent revenue engine above and beyond our research and development programs uh, and our uh, intellectual property monetization strategy. We wanted to have a new source of revenue that was also uh, inclusive of our community that was um, uh, really focused about around education and about kind of doing outreach to the vast community of people interested in space. So that's, that's kind of how we came along with, uh, built the model of, um, of Better Futures. And you can find our upcoming programming at betterfutures.space. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, we've got, this is our main program. This is kind of, our, I'd say our flagship, uh, the Living in Space program. We do it monthly uh, and we look at lots of different aspects about going to space, but it's all about people. And so we focus on the moon, Mars and space stations. Uh, there's a whole fleet of new commercial space stations in development. Uh, it's going to be kind of a race, but I think the space stations are going to beat the folks going to the moon. And I think those two will both beat the folks going to Mars. So we're trying to kind of keep our finger on the pulse of all of that. And ultimately, you know, we'd like to see 15,000 people living in space. Now that's an arbitrary number. 15,000 is mind bogglingly large. Um, I think there's uh, seven people on orbit today. So the idea of 15,000 anywhere, uh, at the asteroids, at, on, on the moon, on Mars, at, at space stations, the idea of 15,000 people living in space is, is kind of bonkers. Um, I picked that number because that's the size of my hometown, right? 15,000 people, it's a city. It's not quite a city, but it is a small town. And my guess is it's gonna be lots of different small outposts in the way that there's a few thousand people living on the, uh, uh, in the Antarctic that are there for research purposes. Um, and they have tiny, tiny, almost villages, almost villages, uh, a couple hundred people, in some cases, a thousand people. Um, so that number changes uh, with each season and, and the change of seasons. Uh, but I think that those are achievable goals, 15,000 people living in space, uh, the moon, Mars, and space stations. 
And we want to be the folks that are kind of tracking that uh, human migration off world. Um, uh, Dr. Peter Diamandis uh, is one of my professors from Air National Space University. Uh, he is one of the founders, one of the three founders of Air National Space University. He also founded Singularity University, and he's probably most famous for his role in developing the X Prize program. Um, and he said something, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago in class has really just stuck with me. And I'm going to be terrible at paraphrasing because he's a much better uh, orator than I am. But he basically said, like, this is what we're where we're at right now, where civilization is at right now, is as big a leap as that first intrepid lungfish crawling out of the oceans, crawling out of the um, rivers, and somehow wiggling up onto land. And that was a new world recording stopped for that lungfish. Um, and we're at that same place in time and space. Recording in progress. We're going to do something in the next generation. This generation is going to space in a significant way. And it is as big an evolutionary jump as that. Uh, as that lungfish, um, you know, a uh, hundred million years ago, uh, I find that fascinating and amazing. I really, I really do. Um, you know, life here on this world is special, as far as we know, con with conclusive evidence. Um, this is it, and and we are going to take life from here. And we're going to we're going to move it out into the solar system, uh, and it's going to be this generation that does that. So, I I'm fascinated by this idea. I'm fascinated by the changes and the exploration and the science. But ultimately, I'm fascinated by the idea of humanity spreading beyond Earth. Um, Dr. Rupert had a had a line in her slide that said, "When we leave Earth." And I just thought, gosh, that has such a recording a stopped idea. It's a brilliant phrase. Um, so that's what this, that's what our programming is all about. Now I'm going to stop kind of getting all philosophical about that. Um, I want to make sure that I uh, acknowledge my team. Um, you know, this couldn't happen without them. So, um, my two, uh, my two current interns from Korea will be leaving us. Recording in progress. Uh, they're heading back to Korea in, in two weeks and three weeks. So they've been terrific. We're going to miss them for sure. Um, uh, my, uh, that's that's uh, Jion and, and Youngin. They've been great. We're really happy to have them here. Uh, they've really kind of helped streamline some of these processes that we have. Um, Fabio and Yusuf are necessary and, and awesome uh, to handle our technical support. Um, and our three new people, um, Joey, Leah, and um, David, they're really going to be working in the next few months to kind of help refine our story, enlarge our audience, um, and kind of help take, take us and grow us to the next level. So um, really couldn't do this without you all. I really appreciate you all. Thank you very much. Now let's get started with the main content of our program. Um, that was a little bit more preamble than I expected. And I apologize for kind of going off on a tangent about leaving earth, but uh, it was just kind of, I was in the moment, so I went with it. All right, so um, uh, we're going to start with, I'm going to do a screen share here in a moment. Um, this is, this is a, there we go, are we seeing that? Okay, great. Um, sorry, my screen is a little confusing here. 
that. That is in the way. Just a moment. There. So this is a presentation I've given um, a, a couple times in various formats. Um, this is a tool set that I call the new media process. And don't get stuck on the name or anything. The new media is ancient Greek. It means new moon. And we use this uh, here at Liftport and other organizations have used it because I share it a lot um, as a way of helping, uh, helping to tackle big complex problems. And we're gonna talk about what that all means here in a moment. Um, uh, by way of background, um, I went through the United States Marine Corps uh, for four years. I did investment management. I started one of the first internet companies back in, uh, uh, back in 1995. Um, that feels like a million years ago. It was pretty amazing. Uh, I did okay in real estate. And then ultimately about 20 years ago, uh, that's when I got into space. And I started working uh, in the strangest way possible, I started working on the space elevator under a, uh, as part of a team working on the NASA Institute for Advanced Concepts project. And the space elevator, if that's the first project you work on in space, uh, that takes your career in some really wholly different directions. So I don't work on that anymore. It was great. I was glad to do it. I don't have the same confidence in it that I used to have. And then we focused on the lunar elevator because the lunar elevator was constructible now with current technology. And that's, that's, our, that's our complete focus these days. Um, someday we'll have another conversation about the lunar elevator. You can find more about it on our YouTube channel. Um, we don't talk about it as much because we're kind of heads down doing the work. Um, but doing the work made me realize that uh, in order to build this never before built thing, um, we needed a roadmap. We needed uh, tools to build the tools. So we created this, this tool called the Numenia process. And you can imagine it as a, uh, a framework for, uh, for tackling kind of the unknown. Um, it's not a business plan tool, although it helps business plans. It's not a pitch deck, although it does help pitch decks. It's not a project management tool, although it does help you figure out what your steps are in a project. So we created it as a framework to help us just get our arms around this really big, complex compound problem of building an elevator in the sky. So this, this tool set, has evolved over the last 20 years uh, as I've learned more about building a space elevator first on earth and then focused on the moon. Now, as I've learned more about this really complicated system, I really had to understand that what we're doing is, is, uh, is new. There's no, there's no roadmap. There's no, there are no best practices for how to do this stuff. So I'm gonna take us through this new media process uh, pretty fast. Um, this is actually a, uh, uh, a course. I've taught this as a course as uh, six two hour lessons. And I'm gonna try and compress that in the next 30 minutes. So just uh, hang on, buckle up. It's gonna be a busy, busy uh, next 30 minutes. Um, there. And I re I'm sharing this, the reason I'm sharing this is for, um, is for the space community to have a tool set that they can use uh, for the things they're working on, right? This is relevant to the Mars Society folks from yesterday. This is relevant to people that wanna go off to the moon. It's relevant to all the engineers trying to work on space stations. This tool set is useful it's a useful way of understanding that the stuff that we're doing is hard, but that there is a path forward. 
So um, these are all the five main components of the new media process, uh, compass philosophies, posts, stakeholders, challenges, and get goals, investments, and tasks. Uh, and we're gonna talk about all of these um, pretty, pretty briefly. So um, to me, it always starts with uh, your compass philosophies. Where are you going? What are you doing? And how are you gonna act along the way? Um, if you have a blurry vision, uh, you shouldn't be driving. And if you have a blurry vision, you shouldn't necessarily be embarking on a, on a mission to Mars, right? So um, having, having a very clear mission, an idea of where you wanna go five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road. Um, some of the more inspiring missions, uh, visions that I've seen, uh, I would like the United States to have a clearer vision of what our uh, political goals are at, uh, you know, for the United States. But hats off to the folks in China and the United Arab Emirates and a few other nations like Luxembourg that have very clearly articulated visions for their future. Um, the, uh, uh, the one I think I, I really kind of uh, admire is the United Arab Emirates and their goal to have um, seeded Mars with their, with their civilization, with their culture uh, within, the next, within the next 40 years. And, and UAE has a really specific roadmap on how they're going to get their culture to Mars. Um, and they've done pretty amazing work. Uh, you know, China's doing some interesting stuff. They have, they usually roll out plans about every five years or so. It's a rolling pro program. I think that's interesting. And Luxembourg has staked the claim that says they're gonna, they're going to, um, be the finance center of space and they're uh, and, and focusing on um, resources in space. So, uh, you know, a well-articulated vision is super important and, and it should be, you know, longer than five years away and it shouldn't be based on, you know, quarterly reporting the way a lot of American uh, uh, publicly traded companies operate. So that vision is really important. Mission where that's that's what you're doing every day. That's that's the work of going to work. Um, uh, and then values. Who are you as a as a culture as a company that has an identity, uh, and I'll say a citizen, if you will, of of um, you know, with a, with a goal of getting to space, what are your, what are your values? How do you want to act in the process of um, enacting your vision and mission? So super important. If you get that wrong, you are going to have a really, really bad day. Um, and I think that there's a way that you can take all the key words of your vision, mission, and values and prioritize them. Uh, because that changes the scope and nature of your company. And so, for examples, um, you know, Dropbox is a Silicon Valley darling. Um, uh, it went through the Y Common Air program. And they didn't have a product. The only thing they came out of that program with was a single video that that, that the video was their minimum viable product, that, that if they could promote that video, get it out into the world, have it seen by millions of people, that that would validate the market that they wanted to build as a data storage company. Um, and now we all take that technology for granted and there's lots of other competitors to Dropbox, but they operate very, very fast, very, very equitably, fairly. And money was their kind of lowest priority uh, and I thought that was really interesting, just how fast they were able to operate. Now, Kickstarters operate with, you know, I think $6 billion in transactions, you know, uh, um, some huge number, 30 million backers in their community, but they were always focused on fairness. They were always focused on um, 
making sure that the creators of their uh, campaigns um, and the backers of their campaigns got a fair shake. And they weren't really interested in moving very fast, and although they did grow fast. Um, and they were really not motivated by money. They, uh, in fact, they became a, a New York State beneficial corporation, a, a, a B Corp, um, whereas they certainly could have cashed in in the Silicon Valley uh, 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 mindset of venture capital. They chose never to do that. And I think that's really interesting. And then finally, if you're only motivated by money and you're not concerned about being fair, then the simplest thing you can do is just go rob a bank, right? So these three words, uh, fast, fair, and money, these three words in a different order give you a different kind of company, a different kind of organization. So you should take a look at your vision, mission, values, determine what your key words are, and then prioritize those key words. And you wind up with a different kind of company if you do it that way. Um, the next step, whoops, sorry. The next step in the new media process is post policies, objectives, strategy, tactics, and time, temporal and time. And that I think is the meat of you know, how you get started, right? Once you figure out your, your, your vision, mission, values, now it's time to actually get to work. And the first place you have to look at is the policies that exist that constrain or compel your actions. So I live, uh, uh, you know, I have, a, I have an office um, in the city of Tacoma. I live in Federal Way. It's in Washington State, south of Seattle. Um, you know, the office building itself has has policies, right? That's at the hyper-local level. Um, I've got to comply with uh, city and county regulations. Fortunately, my city is really supportive of some things. Um, I got to pay taxes at the state level. There are regional benefits to being in this uh, corridor that stretches from Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, down to Portland, Oregon. This region is very um, technologically savvy with Seattle being the, the cornerstone, um, but it also has you know, massive engineering capabilities here because Boeing started here. So what are the policies, jurisdictions and, and value of being in a region like this? And then what are the national policies? If we're trying to build an elevator on the moon, we certainly have to comply with a lot of national policies with the FAA, um, NASA, NOAA, Department of State, everything. Um, and because again, we're going to the moon, there are, there are international and global implications as well. So understanding the policies that constrain your actions. There, it, um, when I was younger, I was a big believer of coloring outside the lines. As I got older and more experienced and learned some lessons the hard way, I got more and more interested in coloring within the lines. So those are, those are lessons learned, both good and bad. Um, once you figured out your constraints, then you can start looking at um, your objectives, your strategy and tactics. Um, your objectives are, you know, they're KPIs, they're OKRs, they're uh, key performance indicators, they are, um, objectives and key results, right? And there are plenty of books that can talk to you about that stuff. I'm not going to try to teach you what you probably already know. Um, but when you get into the day-to-day -day work, um, you've got to have an overarching strategy and that's that's going to be backed and supported by tactics. And then there's kind of the the day-to-day -day squabbles and skirmishes to just uh, you know make things happen. So in this case, um, the idea behind Better Futures is to build community, generate revenues around the concept of um, 
going out into space, humans going out into space. And so one of our tactics was we're going to build a, a platform for publishing. We're going to build a platform for education and we're going to build a platform for communications. And so the skirmish is this event that we're doing, right? Like it takes a month to put one of these together for two days. And that's kind of the, the day-to-day struggle, right? And sometimes we don't do that well, and sometimes we do it really well. Um, but you know, breaking a big idea down into parts is really necessary. Um, another thing I'm a big believer in and learning lessons from the past, uh, you know, from my own experience of doing this for 20 years, but then also how can we use other, other experiences that are similar but not the same, can you learn lessons there? And so uh, the things that we have used have been uh, exploratory missions like Lewis and Clark, some of the stuff that they've encountered. Um, the Panama Canal inspires us because if we're building an elevator in the moon, that's a big logistics challenge, right? Um, you know, it's a, it's a big, long transportation system. So the uh, various railroads that were constructed is interesting to us, uh, as are some big bridges. So we try to use, use lessons learned uh, from the far past, but then also, you know, the recent past uh, stuff that happens with NASA building the International Space Station and all of their partners um, and, and going back and forth to the moon. So lessons learned can really save you a lot of time and grief if you can look, as, look to history as a, as a, as a teacher. Um, we try very hard to stay focused on the present and really understand the state of the art on a, on a you know, uh, near real time basis. Um, I'm always scanning the news. I think that's super important to be relevant and, and uh, up to date on what's happening. Um, and, and it changes as the state of the art changes, you're, you're gonna have to adapt. Um, I first started working on the lunar elevator, I'm sorry, the earth elevator 20 years ago. Over time, I became less and less convinced that that was a good technology solution. I still think the technology is great. I just think it's gonna be a lot harder than people think it is. Um, but as rocketry, got better and better, bigger and bigger, cheaper and cheaper, the value of the elevator became less clear as uh, the Earth elevator. Um, as we had more and more satellites go into the sky, um, uh, the elevator definitely would have challenges because of the just the sheer a volume of satellites going up. Uh, when we started, um, there were only about 400 satellites in the sky 20 years ago. There's, there's I think 6,500 up there now. Uh, they're not all active. So there's a lot of uh, zombie sats up there, but there's also um, a growing debris problem. And so the state of the art made me change the state of the art of the technology made me change my my core philosophy away away from the earth elevator and more focused on the lunar system um, as the technology just continued to improve and the environment the ecosystem the economy of going to space changed um, it forced me to shift gears to focus on the moon and then like, okay, if you look at the past and then take a look at the present, that gives you an idea about what the future might look like. So we're trying to, trying to scope this in, um, in context. Um, the last section of the new media process really has three parts. It's called the action matrix. The three parts are the stakeholders, challenges and get to goals, investments, and tasks. And they all have their own sections as well. But if you can imagine a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, uh, you know, you're gonna have 
rows, you're gonna have columns. Uh, I just said that backwards, rows, columns. Um, and then they're gonna intersect into a cell. And if you're, using, if you're using Excel, you can have multiple tabs at the bottom. So you can kind of build that into almost a three-dimensional meaning using time you can build that into a three-dimensional to-do list. So this action matrix is kind of built like that, if that makes sense. Um, stakeholders, challenges, and goals, investments, and tasks. So stakeholders are the people who care, right? They're the ones who are paying attention that what you're doing matters. Now, if you've got 7.8 billion people in the world, they are not all stakeholders. Most of them will never have heard what you're doing about what you're doing, most of them. Um, but some of them will, and some of those people are going to be really, really important to you. Um, your clients, your family, your competitors, your government, you know, the media, investors, all of those people have a stake in what you're doing. And maybe it's not financial, maybe it is, maybe it's emotional, maybe it's not. Um, but the defining factor is who cares about what you're doing? And let me tell you from personal experience, getting this right can grow what you're doing and getting it wrong can kill what you're doing. Um, and I've done both. I've gotten it right a few times and I've gotten it wrong a few times. So um, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty complicated balancing act. And so over the course of good experiences and bad experiences, I've tried to break stakeholders up into kind of uh, actionable elements. Um, and it's complicated. All of this goes into stakeholders, right? And we're going to talk about it. So stance, uh, where, where's that person coming from? Do they wanna help you? Do they wanna harm you? Um, you can be a stakeholder and be ambivalent. And, and I, I make that distinction between caring and ambivalent. Um, uh, you know, the city hall of my local town does not care at all whether or not I build an elevator on the moon. They don't care whether we have a good program with better futures. They don't care about that at all, but they do care that they get their tax revenues, right? So, um, you know, they don't care about my goals or vision, missions, and values. But they do care about, am I paying my bills, right? And there are people that are on the fence about whether they want to help or hinder. So they're undecided. And then there are people that are just on the edges watching, right? Uh, maybe they're hoping you fail. Maybe they hope that you succeed, but they, uh, they're, they're just an observer, right? So that's a way to look at stakeholders. Another way is, are they internal to your program or external? Most of them are, are external. Um, uh, no one can do... The, the internal side, I'm going to restate that. The, in, the team on the inside um, is super important for you to impact and use as le basically levers to work with the people on the outside. So your internal stakeholders are super important in order to uh, influence the external stakeholders. So, you know, be nice to your team. They're really important. Um, and then another way of looking at it is at the individual level, right? Even big, vast corporate corporations and big, vast uh, governments all boil down to individual people, right? And individuals can be dropped into different categories, right? Are they a fan? Do they hate you? Are they active, uh, actively angry? Uh, are they skeptics or are they interested? Are they supportive? Do they want to get involved and do they want to do things publicly? 
So most people don't care, but the ones who do care uh, have a big inf- impact on whatever it is that you're doing. This is one of my favorite slides, and it took a while for me to really get this. Um, because you can be mad, or an in, sorry, an individual can be mad at you, and it's it's uh, and and maybe that's okay, maybe it's not okay. But if that individual has access to a community, and that community can get bigger and bigger and bigger, it doesn't take long until there's people marching in the streets. So individuals become communities based on commonalities and building a giant network is extraordinarily powerful um the the movie that they made about facebook the rise of facebook was called the network effect for a reason i really encourage anyone to um go and take a look at some of the wikipedia pages around network effects and metcalf's law uh, pretty fascinating stuff. And I think that the space community that we're in could really, really, really benefit from working our networks better. Um, I think we could be far more effective, far more powerful, far more influential, and we could develop a, little, a lot more control over our futures if we were able to organize our collective networks. Uh, You can imagine the Mars Society is over here, Liftport Group's over here, National Space Society, Planetary Society, but then also the individual companies, the big ones like SpaceX and Blue, the small ones like Starfish, like there's thousands of space companies now. Uh, There's dozens of space advocacy organizations now Uh, And maybe they all have slightly different goals. Moon versus Mars is a common trope, which I dislike. Um, But but if we were to galvanize our networks, we could accomplish some really big things. So um, kind of ponder that for a minute. Finally, as we start closing down, um, stakeholders can be kind of broken into organizational functions. And you work with governments differently than you do with nonprofits, and that's different from how you work with corporations. Um, uh, We break all of our programming at Better Futures and all the stuff that we've done for the Lunar Elevator into these four big buckets, hardware, business, outreach, and framework. I'm pretty sure you all have a pretty good handle on what hardware means since ultimately what we're doing to go to space is all dependent on hardware. Um, But these challenges can be broken into subsets as well. Um, Science and discovery, technology and engineering and production and scaling. Um, I was on a project once that was looking at space-based solar power and uh, you know, there was a breakthrough in the lab that said, oh, you know, we're going to get, you know, 28% uh, efficiency on this solar panel. So I called them up and I called the company and I said, well, you know, the lab and they're like, oh yeah, um, we can only make, you know, uh, it takes us six months to make uh, you know, 500, uh, uh, 500 watts of this stuff. And, and I want, you know, the team I was working for wanted megawatts or gigawatts. So you needed to build entirely new factories in order to get that product from the lab through engineering up to scaling and production. So definitely a challenge there. And we see that in space all the time. Um, How do you pay for it? Who's going to pay for it? What does operations look like? All necessary uh, elements to this. Um, Telling our story, you know, yesterday, uh, Laura Forsett came on the program as she's really, really great to talk about kind of analysis, and she's a really good reality check. She tells us what's wrong with what's with what we're doing. And, and that's really it is not not as she's a curmudgeon. She's a big supporter. 
but um, she helps us uncover our blind spots and our blind spots in this field is that we're really terrible at outreach. We're really bad at telling our story, which is one of the reasons why we created the Better Future series in the first place. Um, Inmarsat just posted a really great, like 30, 35 page um, uh, paper that basically gives facts and figures about just how bad we are at outreach as a, as a global community of space. Uh, it was pretty interesting. I'll, again, I'll post that link here in a bit. Um, and then challenges. What are the, you know, we've talked about the, the policies, but you know, you can change policy as well. Um, what's the environment look like, both uh, from the social definition of environment and the physical definition of environment? What are the laws and policies? What are the insurance requirements and regulatory requirements? So all that fades into into um, uh, all, all of that fades into our challenges section. The final section is goals, investments, and tasks. That's really well known. Like I don't spend a lot of time with that because everybody else knows how to do this, right? What are your goals? What are you gonna try to accomplish? how much are you going to spend? And there's different kinds of capital, right? There's different kinds of capital. And that's one of the things that sometimes gets overlooked. We tend to think of capital as just dollars and cents, how much money do we have in the checking account? But, you know, I have a small team. I've got to, I've got to assign tasks to my people. Um, and so you have to, you know, that's human capital, right? Um, in my field, we don't have a lot of natural capital, but, but in some places we do. Certainly going to the moon and Mars is gonna rely on in situ, in situ resource utilization. So there's a natural capital component there. So goals, investments, and tasks. Tasks are just what you're doing. That's your to-do list. And how, what are you gonna to do to prioritize the things you've got to do? Um, so that's the new media process in a nutshell. I know I went through it very quickly. Some areas I kind of overemphasized. I really think it's important to get the uh, vision, vision, mission, values correct, understanding what your objectives are, what your policies and strategy and tactics are. Um, if, if you get this stuff wrong, it can be very, very costly. But if you get it right, you can do extraordinarily well. So um, I really want to encourage everyone to kind of consider this when they're going out and trying to do uh, these big things that we're all trying to do. Um, whether, whether your goal is Mars, the moon, space stations, or any other goal. Um, I had this slide in that I intentionally skipped, but you know, this all started because my brother and I wanted to have a, uh, buy a fish tank and so my parents convinced us to go build a uh, lemonade stand. So I've been kind of looking at these rules uh, that have ultimately turned into the Numenia process for a very long time. And I think they wind up, they can be a very useful and valuable uh, addition to whatever it is you're trying to do. And with that, I'm gonna switch gears. Hang on just one second. All right, it is time to switch gears and bring in uh, Dr. Edgar Edelbrook. Eg Egbert Edelbrook. Gosh, I've known you for a year and a half. I can't believe I just said your name wrong, guy. Sorry about that. Uh, let me promote you to panelists. Give me a second. And Gion, I'm going to demote you to an attendee, okay? Oh, no, I'm not. I want you to stay there. Yeah, I am. Okay. Never mind. All right. Sorry. A little, <laughs> little technical bobble there. Hey, Egbert. How are you doing, man? Hey, good morning, Michael. Uh, good to be back. How are you? I'm good. It's a little early in the morning for me, but we're we're good. We're good. I'm I'm uh, happy to see you. Uh, I gave a little bit of preamble this morning about uh, 
uh, about your stuff. And we're going to talk about it in detail here. Um, do you want to show some slides before we jump into the conversation or how do you want to do this? Yeah, I, I prepared some slides. Part of them um, I shared before, but I think this audience may not have seen them yet. So I think I just uh, I could go uh, through the slides. And uh, after that, I'm happy to uh, have a long conversation with you. Awesome. All right. Um, I'll share the screen. You share your screen. Yes. I am trying to find your bio in my notes and I do not have your bio, which is odd. Okay, I don't have your bio. Can you give your background, please? Yeah, of course. Sorry. So uh, my name is uh, Egbert Edelberg. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Spaceborne United. Um, it's, uh, it's been uh, about five years now, five very exciting years, a roller coaster actually. <clears throat> my background is not in space technology or biomedical uh, things. Uh, my background is in organizational innovation, and I did my PhD in courage development in organizations. It has been very helpful in, in doing what I do. Um, so perhaps it's good to already reveal um, some of the origin, my personal origin. Uh, I am a donor for an IVF clinic for a couple of years now. Uh, some 10 years now, actually. And from that role, I learned uh, a lot about um, IVF technology, assisted reproductive technologies, and why my passion for space exploration uh, combined with my curiosity about if this specific IVF technology could be re-engineered. So in a way that it could also be applied in space because that would help humanity to learn and address the challenge of reproduction in space. So that's where it really started some eight years ago. And after talking to more and more experts, it appeared that this is even too complicated or at least ethically too delicate for the big space agencies to address. And they're explicit in, in, um, in embracing and encouraging focused biotech companies like Spaceborne United to address this crucial challenge. I mean, if humanity wants to become a multiplanetary species, and obviously uh, they do, uh, we also need to address the reproduction challenge. So that's, that's our focus. Um, uh, babies in space and, and, and expanding the human comfort zone. So, um, we do three things. Oh, by the way, the building you're looking at is the beautiful UFO-shaped building in the Netherlands, in the city of Eindhoven, where we also have office space and our headquarters. We don't own the building, at least not yet, uh, but we really like it. Um, we do three things. We research the conditions for different stages of human and mammalian reproduction in space. We translate the outcomes of this research into mission designs um, and a missions program, um, including the implementation partners, and the execution partners. Uh, and the third thing is we translate the research outcomes into biomedical equipment required for these missions. So that mainly focuses on the first stages of reproduction, the conception and early embryo development. And we are therefore focusing on, on re-engineering the existing IVF technology for this purpose. So um, <clears throat> I already briefly went into this topic. You would expect something big like this to be addressed by the big agencies or the commercial big, uh, the big guys, the, the, the Virgin Galactics or SpaceX, as they are also um, as they also work on, on, on plans to, to uh, create human settlements on Mars. Um, so it, it's a matter of, of, of difficulty of, of spending taxpayer money on ethically delicate matters, but also um, a president needs to, to show his course. And, and, and uh, it's usually if, if Trump 
uh, focused on Mars, then Biden needs to refocus on, let's say, let's first go to the moon and then to Mars or vice versa. It's alternating every so many years and that's killing for NASA. So that's also difficult for them to address these long-term challenges like the reproduction uh, topic. Um, but they, they uh, explicitly encourage companies like us. So I've been talking about different stages of reproduction because obviously reproduction is not just one thing. It's a topic that, is, that you can divide in different, different stages. And we focus on, on the different pieces of that puzzle. Uh, I mean, we are, the, the name of our company is Space Born United. So that's a clear hint to our very long-term uh, mission and goal of also enabling childbirth in space. Uh, but 80%, 85% of what we do is focusing on this very first stage, the conception and the, the very uh, first five days of embryo development. Space is also not one area, it has many areas and we start in low Earth orbit. Um, so, the existing assisted reproductive technology, we're extending this into space, and then we have ARTIS. So we, we have called this Mission ARTIS. This is our mission patch. Um, so what kind of challenges do we have to deal with when re-engineering this technology? Um, of course, when, we, when you take uh, space life science, you take life science experiments to space, you have to deal with the two big challenges of, of, of uh, gravity and, and radiation. Uh, so we, we, are have, we have to designate a specific orbits, specific low earth orbits, um, to stay well under the norms for radiation exposure, especially, especially the norms for radiation exposure for uh, embryo development. Um, so that's fairly quickly tackled. Um, the gravity issue is, is much more complex. Uh, we need to convince ethical committees and, and, and we need to get a regulatory approval before we can actually move from animal cell, using animal cells to using uh, human stem cell embryos and later on actual human gametes that turn into human embryos. So we first have to, we also have to provide Earth-like gravity. And we do this by adding rot uh, adjustable rotational uh, gravity in our IVF device to, um, to make sure that these embryos experience the same gravity more or less than on Earth um, as a first step, because um, Eventually, we, uh, the, the added value of what we do, especially from a scientific point of view, is that we can prove uh, that we can study the partial gravity effects on embryo development. So if we want to have sustainable, independent human settlements on Mars, we also need to reproduce there. And we need to be able to be sure that the Mars gravity environment will be sufficient for healthy embryo development. And many of our experts have very serious doubts. It's a big difference, 1G or 0.39G. So we might learn that this will not be enough. And then we can start varying the gravity level uh, to any level that, that will prove to be the minimum level. That might just be, I don't know, 72% of the Earth gravity. Um, but this, this outcome, this, this partial gravity research, is crucial for um, the architecture of, of, of some structures on, on Mars in the future. If, for example, we find out uh, the Mars gravity itself is just not enough for healthy embryo development, solutions could be created in terms of uh, rotating uh, bedroom areas for pregnant women. Uh, where they compensate during, the, during their sleep and they spend seven or eight hours in, I don't know, 1G or 1.3 Gs. That's for the astrobiologist to find out. It's our task and our challenge to find out what is the level of gravity that is required. So that's the scientific added value of what we do. Um, here you have a uh, visual of 
standard on earth uh, IVF technology, the, the, the embryo incubator. This is the main technology that we are looking at and re-engineering. Uh, on earth, it is used for people with an IVF indication. So that means uh, they have problems to get pregnant in a completely natural way. Um, we are not using this device, so it's used for embryo selection. They, they, they insert um, uh, usually some 10 or 12 embryos, uh, very fresh embryos from a patient, and then they, they have this time lapse. They monitor the embryo development on an individual basis, and after five days, they can, they can uh, see which of the 12 embryos uh, have the best odds to be to result in a successful pregnancy. So that's called embryo selection. Um, we are not using this technology for embryo selection at all. Uh, we are not working with, with um, well, let's say compromised gametes. We're working with, with uh, female and male cells that are perfectly normal and capable of reproduction without help uh, in a normal situation. So we are using this technology to create a life support system uh, that enables the embryo development. And we add a few functionalities uh, to make sure it will also enable conception. So the, the, the semen, the sperm, and, and the oocytes, the female cells, they are separated in the beginning and they will only, um, the sperms will fertilize the oocytes in space. Um, we also add the functionality of cryo storage. Uh, it's important that after five days of embryo development, we pause the embryos in their further development because that cannot happen in the outside the natural womb yet. Uh, technology hasn't achieved that level yet. So before we recover the embryos back to the surface of Earth, we need to protect them and we need to pause their development. Uh, so by cryogenic freezing, we pause the embryos in their development, which also protects them from the rather violent return to Earth and all the vibrations and G-forces. So that's why we also add cryogenic freezing. Of course, this is going to be an unmanned, a rather small unmanned recoverable biosatellite in which it will uh, enable embryo development. Uh, that means all of this needs to be completely remotely controlled, obviously. So these um, on earth embryo incubators, they can be uh, controlled manually, uh, but ours has to be completely remotely controlled. Um, so what kind of technologies do we need to achieve this? Um, uh, we, wanna, we, we don't want to work with this very massive 60 kilogram incubator. Uh, it has a lot of um, unnecessary size and mass and volume. So we are optimizing it for mass and volume and energy consumption because taking things into lower Earth orbit is too expensive for that. So we, minim, we, we, we make all these, we use the smallest technologies, so IVF on a chip. Uh, and a lot of microfluidic technology and uh, micro 3D printed uh, life support systems um, and existing prior preservation techniques uh, being used in IVF clinics all over the world every day. So this is a very early art artist impression. I cannot reveal too much about the more mature design because of IP protection. But this gives you a brief uh, idea of, of the, the different biological steps that need to be um, enabled by this microfluidic uh, disc, this life support cassette. So you have different, different reaction chambers on the, on the outer ridges of the disc uh, where the, the, the embryos will develop. That's where actually the magic will happen. And on other areas of the disc, there will be uh, chambers with the different fluids necessary for um, washing away redundant sperm cells after the, 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 the female cells are fertilized. 
Uh, and then there's a different fluid for the embryo development. And after it will be um, um, changed after some two or three days, like halfway of the mission. And eventually there will be other fluids involved in preparing the embryos for uh, cryogenic freezing. Um, and of course, when you rinse stuff away and replace it, it needs to find, um, it, it's, it's considered waste fluid. So we also have areas for waste collection. So what, what ha where, where is this disc uh, used? This is just the key layer of our uh, IVF disc. Um, here you can see a somewhat more uh, detailed uh, rendering of an earlier prototype disc. But it has a lot of other layers um, that are required to, to enable safe embryo development. Um, and we want to, the same as the, the, the IVF technology on Earth, we also want to monitor the embryo development with micro cameras and do the same kind of time lapse afterwards. Um, so there's a layer with micro cameras. Uh, we need to, to stay within the bandwidth of temperature. So there's climate control layers. I think you get the basic idea. And these disks, um, they will go in our uh, device. I will have a a visual about it uh, that explains it a little bit better later on. But the, the device goes inside uh, a rocket. This is an example, uh, Virgin Galactic, a launcher one system. It seemed very interesting for us because we need to have very late access to the payload because we, um, we will work with freshly harvested oocytes. Uh, harvested in an IVF clinic in case of uh, human cells or in a mobile device uh, near the launch pad in terms of uh, what we talk about mouse, mouse gametes, but they remained um, fertile only six to eight hours after harvesting. Um, so we have a very narrow time window uh, because within six hours we need to, after harvesting, we need to get them properly stored on the disk. We, have, we need to transport the disk to the launch pad, insert it inside uh, the payload, close up the rocket and the fairings, uh, allow the, the launch company to do further preparations, launch it into low Earth orbit and initiate um, the fertilization. So that's, that's an ambitious time timeline. But we, we, uh, and that requires a selection of launch providers that allow for very late access. So up to one or two hours before launch. Usually when you join, let's say a Falcon 9 or any other big rocket, you have to uh, provide your uh, experiment uh, even uh, like two or three weeks up front. So that's absolutely not an option for us. We need a dedicated flight. We cannot use ride sharing where other people that let's say have a big satellite to launch and we, we are ride sharing. That doesn't work for us. We need to be in full control of the launch. So we work with a dedicated launch with very late access to the payloads. One of those options is uh, the launcher one system, a very smart approach that uh, takes the rocket, a very small affordable rocket up to about 12 kilometers of altitude by the Boeing. The, the cosmic girl, as the Virgin Galactic call them. Uh, and then you only need this very small, affordable rocket to do the rest uh, all the way up to uh, low Earth orbit. But still, there are other interesting options, uh, which I will explain in a few minutes. Um, so as I mentioned, we, we uh, designed the missions, uh, let's say door to door, starting in an IVF clinic, um, all the way um, from um, the launch to the operational stages and, and the recovery and then the transportation back to the IVF clinic for examination. Um, and of course, before the launch, there are, there's a lot of 
preparations to do the pre-launch stage. Um, I don't think it's necessary to go in, into all these details, but just as an example to show um, the, completeness, the completeness of what we need to do to define the, research, the, um, the missions program. Of course, we don't do this just with a, a few people. Uh, we need a lot of help and support from our implementation partners and expert teams. Uh, this keeps changing. There's new companies joining again. Um, but this gives you an, an impression of the type of companies that are involved to help us with the preparations and the execution of our missions program. Um, yeah, I should. Uh, I should name Cranfield University as specifically as they are doing a lot of work for us. We're very happy with them. Uh, they've been helping us for, about, for at least four years now, uh, a lot of people. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about space ride in a minute because they're also um, crucial for us. Um, so what's gonna happen? Um, in the near future. Um, I learned from Michael that um, a nice phrase, hardware beats PowerPoint. So up until now, people could say we are a PowerPoint company. We have nice plans, nice designs, nice experts, but that's it. We have a good story. Um, but fortunately, we have transitioned already into a hardware company because we, are, we have started uh, making, uh, making the assisted reproductive technology uh, and we're actually getting it into space probably before the end of this year. Um, so, oh, this, this slide is actually obsolete already. We're not gonna work with Denmark University anymore. They have great stuff, but they charge too much, we found um companies that do it even better for um, a lot a lot less money um, but the fact that we uh, get get our hardware in space our very first ivf in space prototype it will be joining a test flight uh, probably by the end of this year maybe january probably november december there will be a lot of media craziness uh, by then um, and next year or early 2024, we will have our first uh, life science experiment in space. So then we will also include a first, um, the first mouse gametes, um, the mouse sperm and, and, and eggs inside the disc. Uh, and we will monitor actually the, the embryo development in space. So that's what's happening in the near future. And, and, and the hardware manufacturing is, uh, is being, um, it, it's, it's being done as we speak. So I showed the example of Virgin Galactic with the launch one system as an option that we've explored very seriously. Uh, had a lot of discussions with the, with the, the vice president um, of, of um, Virgin Orbit, Stephen Ali, Alice. Um, but we've been also been exploring other, even more affordable options. There is this uh, Dawn Aerospace. They're making uh, fully um, reusable small aircraft. We're seeing uh, the MK2 version in the picture. Uh, and they're working on a much bigger one, the, the, the type that we could use. That is capable of carrying 150 kilograms into low Earth orbit. This one is only capable of transporting, I think, about five to ten kilograms. And the question marks uh, are referring to uh, the space ride option. So that's probably the company that we will be working with. We are in a discussion with them to in, in much detail. Um, there will be some press releases soon, but I cannot reveal too much until then. So this is public information. It's also visible on our LinkedIn page. So nothing secret here I'm sharing. So what do they do and why is it so smart what they do? 
they go even further up into the atmosphere without launching the rocket, um, even further than virgin orbit. They take the, the, the small launcher one up to 12 kilometers, but space ride will take their small rockets um, to an altitude of 25 kilometers. So by then you have skipped about 99.8% of the atmosphere and the atmospheric drag. So then you only need a very small affordable rocket that doesn't have to uh, deal with so much air resistance or atmospheric drag. So max Q or those terms, they don't mean anything anymore pretty much for, for, for this situation. So after the balloon reaches this altitude, the rocket is released and does, uh, and the main engine uh, fires it to, uh, to low Earth orbit. And uh, we, we expect we will be working with them. But in a few weeks, there will be news about it. Other implementation partners that are very important for us. Uh, this is a spin-off from Cranfield University, actually, a group of young um, engineers, um, PhDs, um they've already had their um well let's not go in too much detail this is the company that is especially helping us to manufacture the microfluidic disc and the other subsystems that form the life support system inside our bio satellite so inside the oh let me go back quickly i didn't explain this visual here this is showing a re-entry device um, with the capability of, of bringing back payloads from orbit to the surface of the Earth um, with the heat shields and everything. Uh, so we are talking to different providers. It's, it's unusual to take stuff back to Earth. Well, of course, when you're sending humans to space, you want them safely back on Earth. But for the rest, 99 percent of what you sent up to space is satellites and other stuff that you don't need to to uh, to bring back in one piece but in our case we're doing uh, life science experiments and we want those embryos back to examine uh, so inside this such a re-entry device is where our satellite will be um, <clears throat> and that's where they come in and this is another um, Another uh, short visual that is showing a pressure vessel. You see, you see a disc which will be mounted inside this re-entry device. And on top of it, they're building a pressure vessel. And you see some cylindrical shapes here that includes our disc um, and a liquid nitrogen cartridge for the cryogenic application and some other subsystems to provide power and, and telemetry and all the, the other standard systems. I mentioned Cranfield University with Professor Cullen uh, and some uh, graduation students. We, we, we've learned a lot from a lot of uh, uh, mass science graduation projects where also students were involved. Um, but what we do is not only helpful to address the reproduction, uh, the human reproduction issue. Um, there are additional applications that people keep, um, um, well, they keep explaining to us and we, we, we are convinced now that we will also be able to help in selecting which mammals could thrive in the Mars gravity environment. So uh, with people, it's, it's feasible to tell them, okay, you're going to be a you're going to be pregnant. That's not healthy for your baby. You need to spend some hours each day or night in some rotating area. And they will do it, of course. But that's very difficult if we really want to terraform Mars with, with uh, uh, biodiversity and, and plants and trees and, and, and uh, animals living there. Well, we're not going to build the structures for the animals to compensate for the lower gravity. So we need to find out um, which animals could thrive anyway in the Martian gravity environment. And uh, we can also study um, uh, from 
mammals in our device. It's considered a research platform in that respect. And we can study which, um, which mammalian embryos will thrive in 39% of the Earth graph. Looking at the time, I think we have time. <coughs> so what will be the future of reproduction in space? This is the very, I have been informing you about a pretty near future. This is gonna happen in, in just a few years. We will have the very first human baby conceived uh, in space and not on earth. And a lot of people and, and nations see that as a step in human evolution. Um, and, and that's why we are not only uh, providing scientific data and filling the data gaps around partial gravity, uh, but we also seem to help upcoming space nations, or at least uh, they're showing interest to, to, to adopt our projects because they, they want some unique achievement uh, to claim uh, in this new space race. Um, and being able to say, well, we enabled the very first child conceived in space, not on Earth, seems to be very attractive to them. And of course, our longer term project, uh, actual birth in space is even more appealing to them, but it's more complicated, will take a lot more time, obviously. Um, but the future of reproduction in space um, is of course, um, we think in about 15 to 20 years, it should be feasible to enable um, actual childbirth in space. We're talking about a 24 hour mission. Don't get me wrong. We're not talking about uh, the full pregnancy, the full nine months uh, in space. Humanity is not ready for this. Our experts um, are convinced that this is possible in uh, just a 24 to 36 hour mission. Um, uh, there's some typos there. Uh, the selection criteria are very important. Uh, this is not for just any women. You need to match a lot of uh, mental and physical health criteria. You need to be within a certain age range. Uh, you need to have uh, given birth already. And we think at least twice because the, the, the second and, especially, and, and also the third time you give labor, not C-section, the natural um, um, birth is a lot more smooth the, the second or the third time. Um, and we want to keep any kind of complications uh, to a minimum, obviously. And, it, and we want this woman to be at least as comfortable as possible. And in that way, it's, it's, uh, it's better if if these women have the experience that the second time is much more smooth than the first time. If you only heard about it, then it's more like knowing and not having the experience. So I think we, we uh, want to have participants who have this experience and be even more relaxed. Um, so what we also don't want um, is uh, naturally, um, um, is that the birth or the labor starts uh, naturally during launch or anything. So we want to work with participants who are uh, just over eight and a half months pregnant. In that stage, the, the, the fetus is fully grown um, and it can safely be, um, be, um, be born. And once the, the pregnant woman would be in space with the, the world-class medical staff, um, she will have a, an in, injection uh, and will, that will cause the induced labor. It, it will happen within about an hour. This is uh, done on Earth on a daily basis in many uh, hospitals. So that's a very safe procedure. Um, but I can imagine you're not even listening anymore and you're having these wild images or other concerns, uh, legitimate concerns. We, we have a lot of homework to do. And part of that homework focuses on, on um, um, making sure these, this pregnant woman will not have to endure very high G forces. So we are monitoring the developments of the space sector, um, especially 
uh, spacecraft that will uh, provide a much more comfortable G profile. So one of the examples already is the, the Shara, Shara Space uh, Dream Chaser, as they call it. I'm, you're seeing an image standing me for an, a small a model. The real one is about, um, I think, 15 meters long, and it can, uh, it can carry seven people. Um, so we are monitoring this kind of developments, especially with the, the upcoming space tourism sector. Um, we can expect a lot of passengers that don't want astronaut style six month training to, to endure six Gs or even more. They want more comfortable rides uh, so that will be provided. And if it's going to be uh, comfortable enough, it could hopefully also uh, enable childbirth in space. Uh, I could talk for hours about this, but let's also save some time for the conversation. Uh, some other future aspects that we're interested in, we are uh, following the development of um, the artificial womb. Everybody, I think most of you know, uh, have seen the, the images about the, 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 the baby sheep in this uh, sack of fluids, which is basically the um, artificial womb uh, for animals. And uh, Professor Uy uh, from the Netherlands uh, received a couple of million uh, euros is a grant to, um, to change this uh, animal version into a human version. And he's working on it now and with his team, obviously. Uh, not meant for space exploration purposes, but meant to improve the lung development for premature uh, infants born after only uh, 24, 25 weeks. But we are monitoring this development because we see opportunities to also take care of the other pieces of the puzzle. Um, and there are other groups, Next Nature Network, they're looking at a project called Reprodutopia. They're really looking at very exotic applications of, of assisted reproductive technology. Um, even looking at uh, uh, human babies being born in animals. Well, a lot of people think we are doing crazy stuff. Um, they are doing much more crazy stuff, I think. Um, but it could also be someday, it could be relevant. Um, so a very intriguing project that we are also closely monitoring is uh, the project of the team of Jacob Hanna in uh, the Wiseman Institute in Israel. Um, they succeeded in enabling embryo development with mice for longer than five months, <clears throat> sorry, longer than five days, uh, which has always been this, this, this limit in the world of uh, reproductive uh, experts. And they succeeded in expanding it to 11 days, which is quite an achievement. And uh, it's even for, for mice, it's more than half the gestation uh, period. Um, so, that opens up the door, we hope, eventually, that also our five-day missions could be extended to, to also perhaps 11-day uh, missions. Um, and this group act actually has the expectation and the ambition to further extend the artificial, the mechanical artificial womb um, for longer than 11 days. So we keep monitoring them. Um, yeah, this is basically what I told you. Um, let's not get into um, genome editing. That's another chapter for some other time. Let's do go into one of our uh, really valued colleagues, one of our key advisors, Dr. Sheila Ali. Her expertise is IVF in space. So that's a pretty good match. She has a lot of experience also with the NASA, uh, with the space biology program. Uh, she's an entrepreneur um, in, uh, in Dallas with her own clinic. Um, 
and she's presenting um, about IVF in space and, and her work for Spaceborne United um, for the, the, the community that is not really interested in space. So um, experts from IVF clinics um, interested in reproductive biology, experts in that field themselves are still being really interested in her story that she's telling. Uh, and there's one key reason for it. Innovating and, and, and researching IVF in space apparently also has several benefits for the IVF sector on Earth. And this is obviously also helpful for our business case uh, because it's not, uh, because it's, well, it's not very uh, cheap what we're doing. Um, Sheila was presenting uh, last month um, in Chicago, and in May she has been presenting about it in, uh, in Austin. Um, I think we should talk about the Astro Sexological Research Institute some other time. So maybe let's go to the conversation and close with my favorite uh, slogan that cre creating a spacefaring civilization is like expanding the human comfort zone. And I love the quote from Carl Sagan, our space exploration plans are best described. I forgot how to pronounce this again. <laughs> Dandelion, correct me again, Michael. What was Dandelion, it? Dandelion, we got it. Spreading the seeds of life into space. Yeah. Thank you very much. And let's uh, see if there are uh, questions. Well, tons of questions, tons of questions. Um, always, Dr. Elbrook, it's, it's terrific having you here. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ha have a little bit of preamble here. Um, uh, we know this is a controversial topic. We're aware of it. We respect it. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, uh, I want to I wanna make sure that, you know, I said something earlier uh, when we started the program that, um, you know, the Mars Society is a terrific uh, ally to our, our event series, to a better futures. Um, yesterday they had their, um, you know, the, almost the entire focus yesterday was on their uh, Mars Desert Research Station and their analogs. Um, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a big step between running around in Utah, running around in Australia or Mongolia and having an analog test site for what it might be to explore and do some science on Mars versus what you're proposing, you know, have babies in orbit and then potentially learn what we need to learn in order to have them on the moon and, and Mars. And so there's this, you know, there's a long ways between here and there. And uh, I want to be very clear that while they were very supportive of um, our program yesterday, uh, you know, we're not talking about the Mars Society right here. We're talking about new content, new ideas, new, um, new programming, because uh, we've been doing this with you for, gosh, six months now, maybe more than that. I've known you for a year and a half. Um, and you, you've, you've brought some, I think, fascinating ideas. And, and I've said this on several occasions that I think that um, the work that you're doing, that, that your team is doing, uh, it's unique in the world. It's kind of the holy grail in space that um, despite 20 years of being on the International Space Station, no one's even coming close to this sort of research. No one's, you know, it's politically impossible to do this sort of research right now uh, as, a, as a governmental organization, even if it's what, 14 partner nations on the ISS. The idea of having um, babies on the moon and babies on Mars, it's uh, on the one hand, it seems really far-fetched. It really feels like straight up science fiction. But even science fiction didn't cover this, right? So you are treading in utterly new, un, uh, uncharted territory. 
right? So, so let's take a look at some of the stuff that you're doing, break it down into the parts, acknowledge, um, acknowledge the concerns, and then let's start figuring it out, out like you know, the ways that you're dealing with, with this stuff. So um, uh, let's talk about your team first. Then we're going to talk about uh, you know some of the hardware because hardware beats PowerPoint. Um, but then you know let's go back to the PowerPoint uh, and and really dig into uh, what it is you're doing and why you're making the decisions that you're making. Right? Um, uh, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that the decisions you're making will in, impact the whole of humanity. 25 years from now, 50 years from now, 500 years from now, 1,000 years from now, right? So um, I find that fascinating. And, and before you came on, I was talking about the uh, Peter Diamandis quote about the lungfish, how humanity is taking as big a step as the lungfish did when it wiggled out of the water. So that's where we are. I think that sets the stage. So let's talk about your team. Let's talk about your personal background, your personal story about how you got here in the first place. Um, we've got we've got time, we've got we've got time, and we're going to just dig into this stuff, right? So, um, uh, we're going to talk about you in a minute. I want to talk about your team because you put a bunch of folks up on slides. Um, you know, this isn't one person's crazy big idea. This is this is a community that is working to solve possibly humanity's most important problem. So tell me about that. Yeah, um, so it, it started um, uh, eight years ago when I started wondering, well, as an entrepreneur, uh, you, you, at least I, I do, I have uh, at least uh, three crazy ideas a week. <laughs> So let's say a, a, a 10 per month and nine of them, they don't even survive the end of the month because it was a stupid idea or it, it doesn't work or it already exists or uh, it's not well, um, et cetera. And so some of those idea, they, they survive and they get some enthusiasm and sometimes, well, this is not my cup of tea or not my focus. Um, but for some reason, this triggered a lot of um, a lot of interest and a lot of um, yeah. Let let's summarize it with a lot of interest. And, and the more people I spoke, the the more I expected. Okay, this will be the time when I have this red light. Like okay, it already exists. Some other group is, has has addressed it, but that didn't happen. And I so that motivated me to. To continue to 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 explore this question, like okay, why is this not so, not a, not addressed? Could this IVF approach actually uh, add value? So the, the the conversation started with with a, a lot of uh, talking to the IVF uh, the director of the IVF clinic, who's a very experienced gynecologist himself, and he said, "Well, I'm about to retire. I have more time." I want. To, I think this is really interesting, and I, I see a lot of reasons why this would be relevant. Besides what you already suggested, and I have a few friends. They're ethical experts because, of course, this has big ethical implications. Right. So, um, is it okay if I involve them? And it, it started growing in in that way that other types of experts wanted to be involved. As they they uh, added new reasons why it would be relevant. Also for for uh, obstetrics, uh, gynecology, and IVF on Earth, but mainly for the, the 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 backup plan for humanity, of course, making humanity a multiplanetary species. So um, soon, I I learned that it, that there are these four key uh, um, domains of expertise that were going to be involved. So obviously, uh, space technological expertise. Uh, we would need to understand the space environment and, and how these rockets work and payloads and, and orbits and everything. Um, obviously, um, biomedical experts understanding IVF technology and related technology. Um, 
well, as I mentioned, uh, ethical expertise, uh, which is usually um, intertwined with legal uh, expertise. Right. Yeah, the, the, the values in a society or in, in the world are um, translated into ethical values and in legal uh, frameworks. So we, we, I, when, when I uh, understood, okay, this is something big and it, 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 there's an opportunity to, to, uh, to really seriously explore options to add value here. Um, those were the four areas where the team needed expertise and it kept growing and growing. And of course, it, there needs to be um, a business case. So you also start adding business experts and right. strategy experts and you need to organize things. Your Numenia process, you've been guiding us as well to, to, to make sure we, we, um, we organize in a, in a, in a more um, modern and smart uh, approach, et cetera. So that, that's how the team uh, kept growing. And I, I, I didn't have to, uh, I, I, I couldn't dream of, of uh, attracting people like Sheila Ali or, or Dr. Leyendecker, or I can mention a lot of others. Um, so that's, that's how the team started growing. And, and when, we are, when we felt, okay, we are mature enough to show, to show each, um, our project to the world, to the media, we did a press release and we were, there was a lot of media coverage in like 60 countries. It was crazy. Crazy, crazy and, days. And, but it, it, it also helped in, in attracting people that, that we um, wouldn't have the guts to approach, but they, they approach us like, like Alexander Lyon, they're like, okay, this is, you are doing my dream. Can I join? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. yeah, yes, please, right. Um, so that's that's in a nutshell uh, how that how that developed. You know, I, you know, I said a minute ago we've known each other for about a year, year and a half or so, and I'm continually struck by uh, the similarities between what you're trying to do in your company and what I'm trying to do in my company. That we have brilliant, brilliant people that are you know in our orbits around what we're trying to do. Um, we're both small companies trying to do something uh, monumentally large and and it's that that team that surrounds us that even makes us credible right if you were by yourself you'd just be some crazy guy in the netherlands that's uh you know you know uh one step away from the uh uh, you know, being hospitalized, right? So um, I, I'm the, I'm the same way, right? I'm just I'm just one crazy guy, and in... that, that, that's an important point. I mean, I okay, I have some cr creative thoughts sometimes. I I can network, I can connect people to each other, find the experts, get them around the table. But I never expected to to stay in the role that I that I still have. Right. There was there was only because so many people kept saying Edwards. You should have this role. You're doing fine. That's what you did in your PhD. You connected seemingly different uh, domains of expertise to each other. You can overlook those different things and connect them. And, and I had to learn that this is apparently a skill that is useful in this position. And it is. I thought, yeah. like, okay, I'm gonna. I had a good idea. I found some experts, and then the the real space companies, biotech stuff they, they will they will run the show but uh well i accepted my faith <laughs> and, well uh, that's that's for the good of this all role. it's it's for the good of all of us um i've known for a long time that i was gonna have to step down um that might be happening maybe in a year or two as we bring in other people they're more qualified so yeah it's really good to kind of know where you're at uh you know I mentioned state of the art, like in the in the case of news, but you kind of always have to be have your pulse on uh, your finger on the pulse of where you are also. So you've got this team, um, uh, you know, they're not. They all have day jobs. They all have other things. This is still for the most, most part. Uh, most for the most part, 
um, this is they, this is a helpful hobby for them. That's the way it is for for me and my team. I've got my core, but then I've got my um, experts. I simply cannot afford their salaries, so they're just continual volunteers, which is I'm so grateful for. Um, and then you've got you've got a somewhat similar situation. But how how many folks would you count? Would you say are core to your team that you really can depend on? Um, you know, for advice and information. What's your technical advisory council look like? Uh, well, I lost count. It, it's, it's, it's moving constantly, uh, but I would say about 20 people uh, from, I mean, we have like this IVF team really focused on, on the, the IVF. We have the hardware implementation team. We have the recovery team. Um, and we have the, the, the mission architecture team. So that those are the... Uh, and, and of course, we have some, well, we, we, we don't formally define all the different teams, but uh, most of them we do. Uh, but that's, that's basically, uh, that's the, the, the key group that, that is important now. Cool. Okay, so 20, 25 people, four or five different teams, um, all kind of working towards the goal of... Um, you know, this first piece of hardware. And I know you can't tell me the whole story. I can't, you can't tell me in public the whole story about the, uh, of the hardware. Um, but, you know, you alluded to some stuff that's happening in 2022 and 2023. Uh, where would you say your team is the busiest? Uh, where are you in, on, on what challenges? The, the, the problems that they're working on. What, yeah, what is yeah. that? What, what, uh, not not where because I know you're you're like me you're a digital organization that's spread all over the world you're in the Netherlands uh, uh, I know one of one of your guys is in Seattle here I would, uh, I'd like to meet him someday I know that uh, one of them is in the two of them are in South America that we've had on the program here <laughs> I'm also um, uh, I know one is in some tropical paradise out in the Pacific. I forget where, right? Like you've got a you've got a distributed network just like just like we do. But I wasn't saying where are they physically. I'm saying what uh, you know. What's the focus of say the next six months? Uh, the focus of the next six months is to make sure the, the the prototype is as mature as possible within that time window. Okay, um, and we are. Half of the teams, they're also uh, looking at the next mission because in, in this prototype, we are not including the cryogenic application yet. Where we're, the design is not finished enough that we can actually turn it into hardware. So uh, that, that's one of the key challenges we are now focusing on uh, because it, it's challenging. We, we need to rapidly freeze um, the embryos. Uh, they need to be frozen like within point two seconds we need a temperature drop of more than 200 degrees you could just put it outside the airlock <laughs> <laughs> open the airlock oh, wait that, 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 that could be an approach <laughs> let me share that with, uh, no, with that's like, you're you're in you're in low earth orbit that 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 plan's not going to work um I, i'm i'm being sarcastic here so no of course of course uh so the cryogenic application is um it's one of those challenges. Uh, um, we, we're not sure. We have to do a lot of homework um, for the, the next, well, the, the mission, this prototype test flight mission, well, it's gonna happen. The, the maturity level might deviate a little bit. That's not really important. Um, the next mission with, um, with, with mice, um, there for that mission, mainly the, the cryogenic application is, is, uh, is, is a question mark so far. Um, we don't know if the microfluidic disc, if, if it can um, deal with all the violent um, stage separation, G-shocks, uh, acoustic vibrations. We need to, we're really learning a lot in the next couple of months. And we need to find out more. There's a lot of homework for us in terms of regulatory approval. Right. 
uh, we want to step to move from uh, using animal models to uh, uh, human gametes as soon as possible. But to bridge that gap, we will use uh, human stem cell embryos. Right. Um, as uh, uh, bridging that gap, but we don't know if if that will be enough uh, or how many missions we need to do before those committees will be convinced. So that's. Well and let's talk dollars and cents for a second. This is, these are not trivial experiments. These are, these are multi-million, not tens of million each, but multi-million, four to eight, four to eight million dollars to do just step one and three. It's, is that in the right ballpark? Yeah, we are finding more and more ways to cut down on, on, on those budgets, but around three million per mission, that's what we're looking at at least. Three, three million. Three million for the down. Not for the prototype test. Yeah, the, the, the down on the ground equipment side or the launch side. All included. All in included. Mission. Yep. Okay, so as launch prices come down, you can do more and more experiments. Yeah. Oh, that's helpful. Like the rest of the industry is changing because of launch prices are coming down. So that's great. All right. So, so pull out your crystal ball, um, uh, you know, how many experiments are you thinking you're gonna have to run before you get to uh, a satisfactory result? Do you have a guess? We think three or four. Okay, okay, all right. So still that's not bad, less than $15 million would teach you enough to, Less than $15 million would teach you enough to know whether this is go or no go. And then along the way, you are learning things that are valuable down here on the ground to the IVF community, right? In vitro. By the way, um, for those that don't know, because I didn't know, we should have brought this up a while ago, IVF is in vitro fertilization. And we're going to talk about that more in a minute. Um, but I should have I should have mentioned that, that, that acronym that you keep using. Um, so... So roughly 12 to $15 million would produce enough science to know whether or not you can uh, go to the next stage. And, and in our industry, we call that a gating factor, right? A gating function. Um, so there's, there's a cap to it, a probable cap to um, the upfront costs. But then along the way, even if you fail, and this is something I like to make sure everybody knows, even if you fail, you will have still learn valuable things, financially valuable and scientifically valuable things for the in vitro fertilization community. Is that all true? Did I summarize that right? Yes, we, we are. Um, uh, it's important for us to also add value uh, on Earth. So most likely uh, focusing on the IVF sector uh, and but that there's, there's a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of homework for us to further specify what that would probably be. And there's already been, there's already been one spinoff from the Cranfield team, right? So we already know that there's some stuff that's happening that's got um, commercial and monetary value. Let's talk about Cranfield for a second and let's talk about that spinoff sure. a little bit. Uh, how did that happen? What are they working on? I know you don't can't give any trade secrets away, but you know you, that's one of your longest partnerships, right? That's indeed, three indeed, three or four years. Yeah. The the the, the great thing, uh, well, also uh, Cranfield University, but also specifically Professor Cullen, um, he has a background in 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 medical devices and, and the biology side of things, while he is a professor in systems engineering. So he can combine all these areas of expertise in one, and that's such a perfect match for us. And he, yeah. I think he saw that pretty soon. So he liked, well, uh, I approached him um, and, and we, we, we chatted <coughs> and we met a few times and, and it made perfect sense to, to, uh, to work together. And, and that's how it started. And of course, we, we want to, to, to contribute to education and STEM field education. And, and, and they have graduation, they, they need graduation projects. And we actually learned a lot from, from those students as well. So uh, um, yeah, we could help Cranfield University in that way as well. 
there's a lot of a lot. There's uh, some four other university uh, universities involved, but not nearly as much as Cranfield University. Great, great. Um, uh, can you name the other schools or not able to do that? Yeah. Uh, so there's. Uh, I mean, Denmark, let's yeah. let's. I mean, I'm trying to. I'm trying to like show the community that's watching here and on YouTube the greater community, like, you yeah. know, how can people plug into this? Yeah, so um, we, we've been exploring uh, for a while with the Denmark University of Technology, but we decided um, that for now we put it on hold because it seems we cannot afford them or at least what they're uh, asking. Uh, but but th they're, they're experts in microfluidics. They're really excited about what we do, so they want to stay in touch. and. and so we, we uh, keep the lines open. Uh, uh, Br uh, Bremen in Germany, we get a, a graduation student and a supervising professor. Um, uh, Nottingham, Trent University in the UK, we have a few advisors. Um, there's a new project in uh, the Netherlands with the Technical University of Eindhoven. Uh, they might actually um, provide a small photonics chip experiment that will, uh, yeah, that I'm, I'm revealing this, um, no, no. that will probably be on board the test flight as well inside our uh, pressure vessel. Okay. All right. Uh, because phot photonics is great for, it, it's, um, well, let's, let's not go into the photonics. Let's not go into it. Let's not go into it. I understand. I understand. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I was wondering if the, if you're going to bring it up, and you didn't. Uh, no American universities, no American companies, right? right oh now. yes, American companies. Let me companies. check. It. Well, Paragon. Is Paragon, of course, Paragon. Sorry, I totally missed that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, uh, Rhodium Scientific. Yeah. Sorry, uh, I Orbital Transport, SpaceWorks. Um, yeah. No, sorry, I, 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 I misled you with what I was trying to say. I said that wrong. <laughs> I know there's plenty of American companies. What I was trying to say was um, no, no the universities. Universities, because you know some of the what you're doing is is kind of a political hot button these days, right? So, um, uh, you know, there's organizations like Tris. Trish down in, um, wow, well, sure. what does Trish stand for? Down in um, uh, Houston area. Uh, there are great biospace labs all over the US. Uh, there's STTR programs. There's dozens of universities that could be partners, but. Yeah, there is three that we, that there is some, some contact. Uh, John Hopkins University, they, they, want, we work, uh, they have this very bright uh, young girl. The student, she's very eager to do an internship. It will start in September, probably. Yeah, okay. Uh, does that mean we are collaborating with John Hopkins University? Right. That no. sounds a little bit too. That sounds so, and, and we're, dangerous. We're, no. we're talking to this professor from uh, Texas University who's, who wants to collaborate, and we, we are dying to, to welcome him. Uh, so there are some lines with universities. Okay, that's good. That's good. And that will probably grow anyway. Right. Uh, but we are a little bit understaffed, so we cannot manage all the, we, we want to have good relationships and we need, we need to manage them. And, and uh, so we are not, yeah, our network and expertise network is, is uh, that's not our concern. We, we, we're make, we, we, we need to, um, well, funding is still a challenge. We are in discussion with a large NGO, a wealthy NGO. Uh, that might be the big game changer from a funding perspective. And if not, there will be plenty of others, especially after uh, the test flight by the end of this year. Yeah. But yeah. Co contacts with experts and universities, that's not a challenge. Awesome. Awesome. Um, let's, uh, let's switch gears for a bit um, and kind of talk about kind of your personal origin story. Um, you know, you got into this, you're not a space guy, you got into it by accident, 
and then realize some of its potential. So, <laughs> so walk us through kind of how that how that happened. Um, Cause I think that'll give us some insight into, into who you are and why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah, well, I think, um, uh, of course I, I summarized it during my talk uh, a few minutes ago, uh, but, but my, my, I, I've always had this passion for space exploration. I liked, as a kid, I liked to play with space shuttles and, and I, my, my dad, encouraged it and I have an older brother and he likes technical stuff and um, so I've always had the passion and, and what, read magazines about it and, and saw Discovery Channel stuff about it etc um, um, and, and, and the, the funny thing is I don't remember the exact uh, situation or moment when I came up with this crazy question like hey should an embryo incubator uh, should, should it be possible to re-engineer it to make it work in space? I don't remember. I, I want to have a, this, this one-liner or this cheesy, yeah. fancy. Uh, so like, yeah, huh. this yeah, is yeah. where I got the idea. Right. It's lost. Lost in space. <laughs> um, but it, it's... Um, um, oh, did, did I... No, I didn't tell. Last week, I got the word from this lesbian couple who I, I am the donor for that they will have a second child and I'm going to be the biological father again. So yeah, in, in January, how many, how many is that? Will be born. Sorry? How many kids is that now? That will be the fourth. Awesome. So it's, awesome. it's I, I enjoy this. Uh, there are some more anonymous kids that I don't know about yet. Mm -hmm. There's a law in the Netherlands um, to protect them uh, that you cannot uh, be a donor fully anonymous anymore. They need information about their biological uh, father. Uh, they don't necessarily need to bond with him, but they sure. need basic information and they need the opportunity to, to, to have a contact some, someday when, when they are 12. And then when they are 16, they get my name and traceable information. Um, but four of those kids I already met, and I see them like every two, three months. It, it's, I, I feel so blessed. It's, it's, uh, um, yeah. And and now there will even be a fourth one. There's three boys now, so I hope there will be a girl this time. At, uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Fingers crossed. Fingers and, crossed. And I, I mean, there's the the IVF world. Um, it can be messy. It's it's it's. Um, what do you mean? Well, there it's good that there is this new law, at least in 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 the Netherlands, and I think in most Western Europe, uh, European countries. Um, but before you could be a fully anonymous donor. But there was not in the interest of children, so they changed the law. That was that's good, but there were there were um, there is a percentage of uh, clinic owners that could not deal with the responsibility that sometimes they have to tell a, a couple that is trying to, to get pregnant, sorry, everything we tried everything now, it ends here. I'm so sorry. Wow. Um, I mean, that happens like a couple of times every week for the clinic owners. Right. But some, they, they I mean, that's, well, they have crying couples. Could you really, really don't, well, could you really not help us anymore? Yeah, you have to take that. Well, I, I can imagine that has impact. And yeah, I, yeah. I can imagine um, there are quite a few cases uh, in, in, in the United States. There's like 45 known cases where the IVF clinic owner decided, well, I do, I, 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 I'm going to help these people, but not in a way that is legally and ethically very sound, but I can't take this anymore. All these crying couples, this, I, I feel so sorry for them. I, I, I will produce my own sperm and say that it's from some kind of donor. Wow. So these, there are 45 clinic owners that have been 45 clinic owners in the U S that made that decision. And not just once, but usually tens of times. Wow. And in the Netherlands, there are a couple as well. Yeah. 
So that's so that's uh, that's that's a messy part of the IVF world, the industry. Wow, that's yeah, that's pretty interesting. So how did this happen? Where you had this, um, you know, this has been you've been doing this for years, right? Um, uh, s- several several years as a donor, yeah. Yeah, my 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 sperm was frozen in their uh, in in their fridge <laughs> for a couple of years, uh, and and it helped uh, a number of couples, including two lesbian couples that have kids that I see growing up. That's amazing. So how did it go from? And I know you know I know you don't know like where that epiphany, that, that aha moment happened. But when did you decide, you know, Spaceborne United needed to exist, uh, that, that, this was, that this was your personal, uh, we talked earlier about vision, mission, values, right? So how did this become your thing to do in the world? I don't, I, I, I don't yeah, there, understand the links there. Yeah, there, there is another link that I didn't uh, clarify. Um, I, I did briefly mention that my PhD is in courage development. Right. I, I, I love innovation and I love exploring boundaries and helping other people or inspiring other people to do so, to expand their comfort zones. Um, and, and, and I have, um, uh, so, I have the Courage Company in Dutch, that is the Lef Academy. But let's let's say Courage Company, where, where I help uh, people and organizations uh, develop uh, courage in their organization and with their professionals. <coughs> and um, people like this and, 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 and they encouraged me and they, uh, and I, I feel it's very important to stay credible and to practice what you preach. So I continue to work on my own different versions of courage as well. And I got feedback from people and, and some of them, they said, well, Egbert, it's a great topic. They need it. Um, it's good that you have this practice what you preach um, approach. Um, and to be honest, Egbert, your business courage. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> it's not that big yet. <laughs> what do you think? And that's, there wasn't one person that said this. So I heard it a few, a couple of times and I felt, hmm, hmm, they're right. And, and, and I want to, to, to increase my business courage as well. Uh, and I could help other people with that. So um, I decided to be more open to specific opportunities to work on my business courage. Okay. And that was pretty, that was in that period. So Otherwise, I would have had this crazy idea and let it grow, go really quickly because it seemed so far out of my comfort zone and out of my, uh, well, out of my field of expertise uh, for sure. Uh, but this definitely uh, made a difference in, in, no, let's stick to this challenging topic for a while. This is, a, this is an interesting opportunity to see if it could also help expand my business courage and well. <laughs> I feel Surprise. completely satisfied. <laughs> Surprise, it worked. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. That's I've had some sleepless. This is not my actual natural hair color. This is, there's some uh, uh, shampoo uh, with the coloring. Yeah, that's, 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 that's coming. That's coming. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't do that and show more seniority. <laughs> all right. Um, We've got a we've got a couple interesting comments from the from the audience here. Um, uh, I'll preface it with a, a tiny bit of intro. Uh, uh, Elaine Walker has been in the space community for well, the twenty years I've been here, she's been around. Um, uh, she was a she was a participant in in several of the Mars Society um, analog sites. I think flash. Flash line up in um, up in Devon Island is is what I know most about her. <laughs> she just posted to me. She's been doing this for night since 1994, so that's pretty remarkable. Oh. Um, uh, and so, and she's uh, <clears throat> uh, got a really great like 
music background. She's a professor. Um, all right, so I'm going to read off her, uh, her question. She has actually has two and they're long, so we'll go into them piece at a time. Uh, thanks, Elaine. I appreciate that. Um, assuming centripetal force is the same as normal gravity, how much do we know so far about the difference between spinning gravity in space versus spinning gravity within an existing gravity well, such as the Earth, Moon, and Mars? Uh, where then uh, we'd have the force going in a different direction. All right, so I'm going to answer part of this. Um, and, uh, I know your background is not in biology, Egbert. So like, let's, let's preface that. Um, the United States, uh, Australia and, um, the UK, Oxford, Oxford University of Washington and Adelaide University about 20 years ago had this great, great, great proposal to send a bunch of mice. First, it was gonna to be to the ISS. And then it was gonna be, okay, we'll have a separate spinning satellite because the political liability of ISS is, is impossible. We cannot do it. Uh, so then, uh, then they changed their plan and said, okay, we're gonna do it as a separate spinning satellite. So it doesn't interfere with the politics of the ISS. And it started out, they were gonna send up, you know, 16 pairs of boys and girls rats. And then, then they couldn't, they didn't feel like they were, they felt like there were too many um, variables. So they switched it out and they said, okay, we're gonna have eight pregnant rats. And little by little, by little, by little, by little, this experiment got cut and cut and cut and cut until it no longer exists and all three partners uh, bailed on the project. So that's what we know about the difference between spinning gravity in space is we don't know anything about spinning gravity in space. Uh, and I like the way that you put quotation marks about around spinning gravity. So then uh, I'm gonna let Egbert answer. I'm pretty sure I know, Egbert, what's the difference between spinning gravity in space versus spinning gravity within a, a gravity well? I'm, I'm very eager to learn every day uh, because I, I don't know the answer to this and, and I want to be able to uh, be a discussion partner with uh, our uh, experts on this, uh, Dr. Jacques Van Loon. He's working for ESA uh, um, usually and he's running this um, centrifuge. So he's an expert in, in this field and I, I, want, I, I want to know the answer to this question. So I cannot give it, but he will probably probably be able to. And we also have uh, as an advisor, uh, Professor uh, Floris Weitz, a Belgian professor. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't know. Nobody knows. Uh, no, nobody really knows. Um, Cause we can't, we haven't run those experiments. It kills me that that's been, a, I mean, I just editorialized for a second. It kills me that that's been a staple of science fiction uh, for 50 or 60 or 70 years, the assumption that we can use centripetal force to simulate gravity and then... Hold one thing, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I had the door locked by accident. Um, so we don't know the answer to that. Um, and it's frustrating that we should and, and we don't. Um, I'm quite irritated by that problem. There is, there is a company, and this is not an endorsement or plug, this is just information. There is a company that's actively working on building a space station that will do this centripetal uh, simulant gravity. Um, uh, or, or orbital assembly. Um, when we were doing a review of all the proposed space stations, and, and there's about 14 proposed space stations. They're the only ones they're working on uh, 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 on a on a ambitious plan like that. Um, they don't have a lot of capital, but they've raised something in the neighborhood of two two and a half million dollars. So. 
Um, they have plans, they have blueprints, but they're not building anything yet, so far as I know. Okay, so we don't know the answer. I would really love to know the answer. Um, oh, and Elaine just posted also that she had friends with a guy in SEDS who was working on the Mice in Space program. She always wondered what happened. Well, that's what happened because it was happening right here uh, with the University of Washington was a, was a significant partner. And so I was up at the uh, UW Aero Astro part, Department on a regular basis and it just evaporated. It basically got, it was, it was killed death by a thousand cuts. Um, and it was, as, as an outsider, I was not involved with the project, but as an outsider, uh, it was a hundred percent political fear. Um, there definitely was capital for it. So, um, a little, a little bit later, uh, uh Robert Zubrin from the Mars Society, actually, um, he started this program also, um, aiming to get mice in space in a rotating, uh, uh satellite, the, the Mars gravity bio satellite. There was like, a dozens of universities and hundreds of students working on this challenge uh, but NASA uh, eventually canceled it so that's a, that, that could have provided so much data on partial gravity um, but they didn't I don't know why still wanted to ask uh, uh, Bob Subrin but, uh, yeah he was great on the show yesterday I was really really happy to have him here um, I've wanted him on our program for a while now and uh because, because the total program was about MDRS and, and all the stuff that's coming out of that. I was, he was, he was very great, uh, uh, gracious in joining, joining our event yesterday. Pretty happy about that. I hope to have him back. All right, so then speaking of Zubrin, um, Elaine's second question, when I was asked by Bob Zubrin about what, this is yesterday, this happened yesterday when, she, when, when he was on screen and she was uh, in the audience. So, when I asked Bob Zubrin about starting a branch of humanity versus a research station, I was hoping he'd say we do both at the same time, meaning, for example, immediately begin research on embryos, childbearing, et cetera, on Mars. Uh, that should be considered research. Um, she goes on to say, I assume once we are on Mars with a functioning station, Research other than geology, traversing, et cetera, will include survival skills, food production, and I hope it will include, will involve embryo research or maybe even babies. So Egbert, can you talk about your, one of your technical advisors that came on our show, maybe it was two, two months ago, three months ago, um, the guy from Montreal doing sexology in space. Can you kind of summarize his work? Because uh, I think that really relates to Elaine's comment. Uh, yeah, uh, so that was, um, I mentioned him and I showed him in a visu visual, uh, Dr. Alexander Leindecker. He did his PhD on reproduction and sexology in space, and it was supervised by, uh, by, the, by NASA, uh, Jim Logan. Um, he got his PhD in 2016, um, and he's now teaming up with uh, to Shauna Pandia to start the, the ASRI, the Astro Sexology Institute. Um, and um, well, he was focusing on, on, he also developed the radio E scale and there was uh, dealing with, with radiation and, and radiation exposure levels. Um, um, I'm not sure how so, so it was the it was the guy from Montreal who was talking about if we don't start figuring out protocols to have sex in space, uh, things are going to go awry in a really big way fast. Yeah, um, um, yeah, and he specifically was talking about you know the three year mission to and from Mars that if you don't have rules, then they're going to make up their own rules along the way, and so it was yes, it was about sex but it was also about babies um and and so i, I um so elaine if you want to check that that was ever was that three months no, that wasn't it, that's why i was confused it was not there, there was another event um alexander is still to present on this show there was uh, dr rafael marquez okay 
or not? No, no he's from Brazil. It was it was here. Um, uh, um, Elaine, check out our our channel from about two or three months ago on this on the Saturday show, day two, about three months ago. Um, there was a pretty long conversation about that. Um, but yeah, so so what Zubrin said yesterday was uh, uh, exploration first, science next, and then and then community. And he came, he gave a really interesting uh, history lesson about how um, the French and British <laughs> to the United States, um, the French didn't bring their women, the British did, and the rest is history because they, the British had babies and kids here and built community and the French didn't. And uh, that's, that's kind of how, you know, um, uh, that, that's kind of how that, that turned out. So he was definitely focused on building community. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm with you, Elaine. I, I think, uh, I think, I think there's a lot of different ways of defining research that goes beyond, you know, what's, what are the rocks, what do the rocks look like? So, um, yeah, pretty interesting stuff. All right. So we got about a half an hour la left to work on this. So, um, let's again, bring out your crystal ball and imagine the future. Okay. So we figured out IVF, we figured out, um, uh, fertilization at Leo. We know how to do that. And, and sometime in the next few years, we're going to have the first baby born on orbit, right? And it's only going to be, you know, up 24 hours or less back then. It's, it's a stunt. It's a stunt, but it's a super important proof of concept stunt, right? That we can actually do this. So, all right, so let's just say that those three steps have happened. Can you first kind of give me some time frames for those three steps? Um, uh, first, the, the embryo, embryo step. The first human uh, baby conceived in space. Yeah. 2026. Wow, 2026. I think that should be like on CNN. That should be international news, right? Like I it, think will, it be. will be. But just the prediction, just the prediction. I mean, <clears throat> waking people up. All right. So 2026 for the first. And, and I mean, then there is the baby. That means that that the the uh, regular that the regulatory institutions accept the safety of the embryo to be. Um, to that quality that it can be placed back in a womb to turn right. into a baby. Right. Because the step just before that, uh, the first human embryo conceived in space, that can happen uh, 18 months before. And that's, that might, I don't know, that, that's going to be big news, especially yeah. in the space sector and in the medical sector. That's only 2024. Not that's not far away. True. Yeah, that's what right. we aim for. And if it's going to be a year later, Fine. so be it. We're, we're, we're aiming high. So first, <clears throat> first baby born um, orbitally. When's that? Um, uh, it's 2020. Um, 2040. Oh, that far. I didn't. I thought it was going to be sooner than that. Yeah, I, I I remember, I think I've said 20, 2035 um, is possible. And actually, I think um, as this is be, as this will probably also become this geopolitical thing again, uh, that will that will motivate <clears throat> involved nations to speed up things and to, to the, the defending will not be the issue at all. It's, it's more going to be um, what moral standards are going to be applied. I mean, if China decides, well, we need some unique achievement again, the other, the other one failed, uh, let's, let's claim this one and use our moral standards instead of the ones, uh, the, the, the more Western world would, would probably choose. 
yeah, they could take off another another five years. Well, I mean, it's it, it's not it's um, it's ethically um, a, a thousand times bigger and more complex than than embryo development in space. Right. Uh, but technically, it's not that much more complex. I mean, it's it's. Um, you, you don't need 15 years to, to prepare for this, it, right. it's, but, to, 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 uh, but to do it in a really, really safe way and do a lot of all kinds of testing and maybe, I don't know if they will allow monkeys to, to try it first with, um, if uh, hopefully it's not necessary, et cetera. But, um, so yeah, maybe more realistic would be 2035. Okay. So yesterday, um, Dr. Zubrin was talking about Elon Musk and how he skates pretty close to the edge. And you and I have had personal conversations that I'm going to share, which were basically, you know, Elon Musk has the capability to be in his own rocket. And he's already had three kids that are making national, international news. So I think he has more than I think he has like seven, but three recently. Uh, uh, So, you know, what prevents Musk from jumping into his own rocket ship, bringing one of his girlfriends and going going up for the afternoon or the weekend and uh, and having a baby? Right. Like they could do what you have proposed with nearly current technology is that is that fair is that true does that seem accurate yeah well um i i do know that i mean that there was a great question mark in the beginning on um especially elon musk and, and spacex they're, they're aiming high and fast to 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 go to be the first to go to mars and to bring people to mars and they they uh, it wouldn't surprise many people if he pull, pulls it off the first before NASA. Um, uh, so, so I was really wondering, um, and many with me, it, how is it possible that SpaceX is investing all those resources, all those billions in preparing plans for Mars, if the reproduction question is not addressed to that extent? So they must know, or, or but the, 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 the answers that I, that I get from people that know him personally and that know the, the strategy of, of, of SpaceX, they are focusing on being an engineering company. And that's what they do good. Mm-hmm. And yes, there are these other uh, challenges to address, but they want others to address them. And, and uh, SpaceX has become so big and also depending on shareholders and, and, and um, they're a little bit too big to deal with these experimental, ethically delicate topics. So it, 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 would, it could compromise their, their complete uh, structure and, and, and PR. So they're already doing amazing things. And um, so they want to keep doing good things. Uh, and stay, stay to stick to engineering. So, but if if he wants to change, to change and and, and add a branch of, of life science, space life science, well, he can. Uh, we we know that Blue Origin has shifted gears to have putting a branch of life science into their orbital reef. Like that's already, you know, that gauntlet's been thrown on that one. So. Um, uh, Richard the, Branson uh, yeah. ha, has actually flirted with the idea when his one of his daughters uh, was was pregnant uh, that well why shouldn't she give labor in space and we've also been approached by representatives to talk with them about adoption of our project so I think wow. they're more interested um, than than SpaceX. Um, Interesting. That's a that's an interesting little tidbit. Um, yeah, you know, I don't, uh, I haven't considered like I've considered this from Musk. I've considered it from Bezos, 
had not considered it from Branson's Virgin Group. So that's, uh, huh, I'll think about that. I'll think about that. Um, uh, Elaine asks another question. Um, uh, is it too late or is it not recommended to freeze eggs at 54? Um, uh, I know oh, you. I was thinking 54, uh, 54 Kelvin, but we're talking about age. Egg, her, yes, she and and you know, she has successfully had at least one kid. Um, I think only one. Pretty sure only one. Um, uh, so, so she knows she's. Yeah, the, the 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 age limits are are rising relatively quick. So with the the latest insights in in the IVF sector. This, this age limit is, is uh, raising. I mean, my, the, the, one of the lesbian couples that I'm a donor for, they, um, the mother uh, gave birth at 39. Not an issue at all. It could have been 45. <clears throat> There's a big difference um, between the time that the, the womb can function healthy and, and the eggs. Um, and, and if I remember correctly, the eggs are the, the, the most delicate. So it's, it's the, the, the womb can function until you're 60 easily, probably, okay. or something like this. But the eggs, the quality of the eggs really starts going down after like 35. Um, so I think that, that that is part of the answer. Okay, all right. Um, she's making a comment. Uh, she had Alice at 44 and got pregnant immediately. The pregnancy was perfect, never felt so great in my life. So I thought that was pretty cute. She also is saying that it would be super ironic if Virgin had the first baby in space. <laughs> I think that's super clever. I, nice. have, I never thought about that. Nice, nice addition there, Elaine. Oh, appreciate that. That's that's some great commentary. I, uh, I will and they be... should change their name afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I will be I will be giggling about that one for a while. That's that's pretty that's pretty smart. Okay, so um, let's let's talk about you know you 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 you've heard my my. Sorry, I, I need a little bit of yogurt for my throat. Never mind. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. We've been talking for a while. Yeah, yeah, we've been talking. Of um, so let's, let's talk about some of the implications here. So, um, you know, you know, I did the new media process this morning before you, so that everybody kind of has some context. Uh, I gave, I gave that, that talk, um, and I've worked with you on the new media process before on some stuff. Um, I break things down into four parts. So you've got hardware business, outreach, and framework. Um, uh, we've talked a lot about hardware because that's really, we've emphasized that. Uh, we've talked a bit about the finances, right? 12 to $15 million to get the answers that you need and that there's value in getting those answers that justifies the risk, All right? Um, we haven't talked about framework or outreach very much. So I want to kind of spend some time on that. Um, but we just got in the, a comment from the, from the audience. I don't know who it's from, it's anonymous, but it says, uh, how would citizenship work for babies who are born in space? And holy cow person, I do not have an answer to that. And I don't think Egbert does either. What do you got Egbert? Yeah, um, yeah. Per Beautiful question, uh, logical question. Yeah. Um, we, have, we, we have asked uh, space law experts about this uh, because we got this question earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the funny thing is, there is no um, uh, precedent, uh, uh, legal precedent about this. So it's not decided yet. There are uh, laws that define how that works if, if in case someone got uh, give, gives birth on a plane. Of course, you, uh, usually uh, highly pregnant people are recommended not to join or not allowed, but that's not for reasons of, uh, that's actually for, that's not so much for safety reasons, that's for paperwork, um, 
paperwork reasons and, and, and uh, getting it messy or whatever. That's not a, not really about. Uh, of course, it's it's not recommendable to to receive all the radiation on on that altitude. Um, I'm not answering the question because um, <laughs> there isn't an answer. No, the, the answer is it has not been decided yet, yeah. and all the things that has been decided uh, uh, regarding uh, airplanes, like okay, it, it matters the country where you take off, and other regions they decided no, the country where you land. Um, but it, it will probably be similar, but it has not been decided yet. So it, it would be uh, interesting probably to find a way to have a uh, international nationality or a world citizen with world um, responsibilities being the example or something. Yes, awesome. All right, so let's talk about outreach and framework, right? What rules exist currently that you have to comply with? What social norms are you trying to, to, to tiptoe in the quicksand around um, what are what are the what are those issues? What are you working with, and, and what do you have to do? Yeah, so uh, let's first talk about IVF in space. Um, Forty-one years ago, more or less, when IVF was invented, it was met with an extreme uh, with with a lot of of, of resistance, uh, understandable. Uh, also, from a, obviously from a religious perspective. Like, okay, we cannot intervene in this uh, divine process, uh, this God-given natural miracle, etc. cetera. Um, um, and eventually, those arguments were, uh, let's say, successfully addressed by explaining, well, we are not changing that miracle. We, we are we're not touching it. We're, we're just extending it a little bit. Um, it's not up to me to decide why that is, is or is not a good argument, but we are happy that we have a professor on board who is an expert in this case specifically. I mean, we're extending IVF in space, and there are still religious people that have problems with that. Um, and obviously, it's, it's, there are legitimate concerns. Uh, you should not cause suffering. Yes, ethics for for a great deal, um, and um, and any ethical dilemma dilemma is about okay, you might need to or you have the option to cause a little bit of uh, suffering here, but that will prevent a lot of a lot more suffering somewhere else. So, if the risks for life on Earth, um, human life on Earth, especially is accumulating climate change, asteroid impacts, uh, potential nuclear threats, artificial intelligence going out of hand, etc. Then you it, it, it becomes more and more clear, okay, there's quite a lot of suffering we want to prevent. Um, we have to, to work on plan A, saving planet Earth, keeping it uh, livable for all the people. But it becomes more and more wise to work on this plan B. So that plan B would, will save the future generations, thousands, millions, billions. Becoming a planet, multiplanetary species. Yeah. Wow. Um, can we expose a few dozen embryos to, um, to the dangers of space radiation? Uh, that's not up to me to answer that question. I fully understand and appreciate the concerns about it, but that's the kind of concerns that we, that's the ethical kind of concerns that we, uh, that we, we, we receive questions about, legitimate questions. And, and, and we, 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 we are in discussion with ethical committees to, to find acceptable answers. Uh, that, that's about dealing with embryos, of course, we're, on the long run also talking about um, childbirth in space, which is a completely different chapter. Um, and, and that's, but it's the same principle. Um, what kind of risk levels would be acceptable for what kind of rewards for humanity or 
uh, for the involved people or companies or us or um, um, and that that's a, that's a big responsibility and we, we, we need to uh, we're, we're always open to receive new perspectives that we might have forgotten about we want this to be a, a large dialogue and anyone could uh, could 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 get involved in it um, it's it's so important it's so important um i'm gonna i'm gonna put a plug in so i'm i've an acknowledged nerd several times uh i want you to watch this video i'm gonna put it in the chat here uh when you get a second um it's brilliant uh there's a channel called kirkazat on uh on youtube and they do uh they do pretty educational, pretty smart, well-researched uh, uh, videos, and and okay, I'm a bi I'm biased because you know they show have showcased um, my space elevator in e either the whole show or um, you know their 10 minute videos or 15 minute videos. Or, or, or you know, they have got a whole series on space and space exploration and lunar development and Martian development. They have a great, great channel. Um, Twelve hundred hours of research per video on average. Yeah, I mean it's really crazy. robust. Yeah. yeah. So this video that they just posted a few days ago is about the last human. Like when you know when is when will the last human be born? And so they kind of go back in history and they talk about, you know, the Neanderthals and the early humans, like who we are now. Uh, we've only been around for 200,000 years and they look at, um, you know, the history of mammals in general and they usually last about 4 million, blah, blah, blah. So they go into that, right? And so the first part, it looks like it's gonna be really dark, right? Like, wow, there could be a point where the sun goes out and that's the last of humans. But then towards the end of the video, they're like, Oh, but wait, if we solve these problems, then we're gonna start migrating out into the solar system. And then we're gonna start migrating to other stars. And then we're gonna start migrating to other galaxies. And, and there's no such thing as the last human. So I thought it was, it started out like, like really dark and then there was a plot twist and it got to be pretty neat. So I'm gonna really uh, encourage you to, uh, to, to watch this and, and the audience to watch this. I uh, considered showing it uh, in this program as preamble for our program today, but uh, I don't know what the rights are and I don't want to step on them and I don't want our video to get banned and, and the, the sound is vital. So rather than, rather than uh, you know, incorporate it into our program, I chose to just showcase the video itself. But, Definitely encourage folks interested in this problem to think about just how big and how important what Egbert and his team are doing because uh, um, because I think I think I think he and his team are the reason that this video is going to be possible. So, um, all right, we're going to wrap up here in just a minute. Um, so the the. The legal stuff, it's uncharted territory. The social stuff is still, there are examples of other things that have charted carefully and successfully. So there are, there are some precedent that you think you might be able to follow. Um, so the last thing is really to talk about outreach. Like how do you tell your story in a way that you get, and get that you gain engagement and um, and acceptance, right? Because it takes a while for big breakthroughs like this to gain traction in the headspace of the world. Yeah, uh, I understand. And, and by the way, this this Kurz um, Gesagt um, movie I fully support it. It's it's very inspirational. It's a little bit mind blowing, and I've I've considered to to post it on our LinkedIn page because it answers the why of Spaceboard United to some extent. So sure. it's, it's, it's amazing. I recommend it totally. Um, so outreach. <clears throat> yeah, we, 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 we feel uh, a responsibility. Just for everybody to know, that was not scripted between us. I didn't know you had seen this already. No, 
Great. No, I, I, I was, I've shared it with many people. Excellent. But not, not on the LinkedIn page yet. So it's, it's, I'm happy that you also saw it and yeah. Yeah. You're connecting it for the good reasons to, uh, to your show and a little bit to us. So um, outreach, we, we, um, we feel an opportunity and a, and a responsibility to also accelerate uh, the space life science research because the, the, if you look at all the, the different companies in the space sector, 95% is, is engineering. And they're doing, there are a lot of companies doing a lot of good things, but the, the life science part, the space life science part, it's, it's, uh, there's so many uh, challenges that, that need to be addressed. So the fact that what we are doing is also triggering a lot of media interest um, is, is we, we hope um, that, it, that it also inspires people um, to choose for such an occupation, so young people, but also it, it, it sheds some light on, on the, the undervalued, uh, on, on and this undervalued aspect of, of space science. It, it, it's not in balance. It, it's it's uh, okay, maybe it should be 70% uh, engineering, but there, it shouldn't be 5% life science. Right. It should be 25, 35, I don't know. So that, that in, we need to correct this imbalance and, and we feel a little bit of responsibility to help there as well. I mean, for the rest, um, we think it's crazy that, that uh, for 50 years, people have been saying, okay, we're stuck in, in, this, in this meeting room with this, this problem, it's complex, we're stuck. But come on, we've put people on the moon. We should be able to solve this. Yeah, you need a reference for this great achievement that, that humanity fixed. Um, in, but, but come on, 50 years or what is it? More than 50 years we've been using that phrase. Yeah. It's really, yeah. it's time for something new. Something, the, I don't know, maybe it's bigger or not bigger, but something new. The next new. giant leap, the next giant leap. So yeah. we hope to contribute to boosting global self-esteem as well by providing a new unique achievement. Come on, we will fix this problem as well. Hey, humanity created babies in space, come on. We, we can solve this problem in, in this meeting room as well. Um, but that's not completely an answer to your question, I understand. Um, we don't have the illusion that we will be able to convince uh, everybody that what we do is good. There's, first of all, quite a big group of people who keep saying, uh, come on, don't waste uh, any dollars or minutes on plan B. Right. Uh, we have a plan A. Of course, of course, plan A is, is crucial. We should focus, I, I say the same what Elon Musk says, yes, 99 point something percent needs to be focused on plan A. That's the, the big thing. But come on, it's, it's, it's too evident. Uh, it's like Professor Kakus used to say, why are there no dinosaurs anymore? Because they didn't have a space program. Right, right. If you want, if you want to go extinct, I mean, extinction is the norm. 99.9% right. .9 of all species went in, uh, extinct. If we want to continue living and there's so much inspiration and, and enriching the human uh, experience as Elon Musk likes to say it, becoming multiplanetary is a good idea. So we need some people to focus on it and we're happy that we are contributing. Brilliant. All right, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Elbrook. We're going to switch to our next speaker. Thanks for this marathon conversation and the opportunity to go into a really- Time flies when you're having fun. Right, My right, pleasure. Right. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Right on. See ya. Bye. -bye. Yeah, that was uh, this conversation. I think is so important, and uh, and it's kind of quiet in the in the larger space community, space advocacy community. So uh, it's just it's just necessary. That's why we just keep coming back to it. Um, but now we're going to switch gears and we're going to bring on. Uh, I think it's Terry. Let me look at my schedule here. Yep, great, Terry. Uh, we're going to bring on Terry Trevino. Um, 
Uh, Elaine, by the way, uh, Egbert, if you're still listening, um, Elaine asked a question about uh, where do you get to uh, cryogenic technology? Uh, have you talked to companies like Alcor? She's a cryonics member. So if you wouldn't mind chat, typing that answer in the chat, that would be helpful. Um, where's, sure. your, where's your cryonics technology coming from? Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demote you in a moment and bring on Terry. Uh, and by the way, uh, Elaine, really appreciate your, uh, your, your interactivity here. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, moving on, because this show never stops. All right, uh, Terry Trevino, are you ready, sir? Um, I am promoting you to audience, go up to panelist, okay. Hey, Terry. How are you? How are you, sir? Fantastic. Great. Uh, give me a second. I'm going to bring up your bio. Egbert, I'm going to demote you. Thanks a lot, sir. Appreciate it. And moving on. Demote sounds like the wrong term. It sounds like <laughs> you've done something wrong. I'm just going to... Yeah. Having I mean, been fired and demoted before. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to remove you from the panelist section. That's what I'm going to oh, do. Oh, beautiful. All right. Change to attendee. Okay. Terrific. All right, Terry. Uh, Terry Trevino has a long and storied real estate career of over 30 years. He also remains passionate about space. He has always remained passionate about space and chasing his desire to become an astrophysicist. Now that that goal is in sight, I thought you finished it. Uh, and saving our world remains the most important vision of our generation. Yes. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Edelberg just said something similar. Trevino finished his master's of, space, master's of Science in Space Studies with a concentration in aerospace science and an emphasis on space operations. He was recently inducted into the Society of Physics Students of, of the American Physicists Physics Society. He is the assistant manager at the University Observatory and successfully defended his thesis on exoplanets and, escape and eclipsing binary stars properties using ground-based telescopes, searching for the proto-planetary neighborhoods where they live, leading to several... Boring. Sorry, what? So boring. No, it's boring. It's not that boring. Um, uh, he's on a team developing a satellite tracking software using MATLAB, working on, uh, working on seeking several grants for a peer group of master's and undergrad students and the propagation of algae for an ISS student study. Uh, recently received his AIAA certifications in propulsion engineering, launch vehicle design, habitat architecture, and astrodynamics. He has recently partnered with the Swiss School of Disruption, representing their online education program. Trevino is licensed to practice real estate since 1994. Since 2000, he has practiced commercial and residential development and leasing offices in San Francisco, California. Uh, so let's, that's a pretty fascinating background. Curiously, I have a real estate background that is microscopic compared to yours. Um, but it's the space bug that bit you. That's the reason we're going to, that's the, that's the reason we're talking today, right? We're going to talk about the space bugs. So, um, we, uh, yesterday we spent a lot of time talking about analog sites. Um, uh, Casey is going to talk in a little bit about, uh, about analog sites, uh, also MDRS. So we were very, very, very focused on Mars, Mars development, how to look at, you know, how to become a potential astronaut and analog astronaut for these sites. So yesterday was totally focused on Mars uh, with the, you know, strong support of the Mars Society for helping uh, coordinate that. Um, I wanna spend more time talking about the moon 
we usually on this program talk more about the moon. Um, uh, and we talk more about space stations. So, so Mars wasn't really getting its fair share. So uh, we wanted to maybe, you know, emphasize that yet. Um, so let's talk about your trip to uh, um, uh, North Dakota. Um, and let's talk about what you're working on. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Brilliant. Well, I'm gonna share a quick story with you and um, I'll throw my slides up here real fast. So <laughs> the beauty of, uh, first of all, thank you, Michael. You're always uh, very kind to include me. And uh, I really appreciate that. Yesterday was fascinating. It was always great to see uh, Shannon and Dr. Zubrin and uh, all the others. But uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, I'm a big fan of yours too. Let's, let's do it. Uh, this ben, is, the, I think this is the first time we've actually had you on the show though, right? That is correct. I'm always in the background. Yeah. Uh, were you on the conversations? Did uh, Lee bring you on to on screen before? I think I came in as a, as a uh, fill the gap uh, <laughs> uh, one day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. That, you know, our, our world is an interesting world. We really are in a, in a place, in my opinion, where, you know, we really, we should be considering our next moves. And, uh, you know, these past few years certainly proved that. Um, I think the lunar surface is probably within reach a lot more quickly than Mars, I hope. Uh, but if it's going to be Artemis, then we, we might be waiting a while. Uh, hopefully not. But uh, yeah, the, the we worked really diligently over the past few years, uh, haven't we, uh, to kind of get the word out. I know uh, you per personally have been doing that for a long time, so I appreciate all you do for us. Awesome. Uh, we are heading back. Looks like we're heading back sooner than later. Uh, I believe... What, what, who's on the way now? Rocket Lab is there. Capstone is probably very close to and, and already in their rectilinear orbit. I like to say that word, rectilinear. I don't know if that means it's going around and, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand that orbit. It looks like it's a figure eight. Um, here's, here's, here's Earth. Here's the, uh, the moon, yeah. obviously different sizes. So they're going to the Lagrange point area is it l1 right? l1 yep they're going to l1 and uh it's a giant uh it's a giant orbit that um gets it between a thousand and thirty thousand kilometers from the surface of the moon wow. it's it's a it's a it's kind of a halo um it's kind of a halo, uh, but it's a strange halo. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty interesting. Um, I'm a, I've been watching. I mean, you know, because we're going to the Lagrange point with our with our yeah, uh, the tether. Yeah, uh, we're, we're watching that one real close, real close. I was so worried when they lost contact with that thing. <laughs> I but, don't know if he's. But I, I think I made. So, yeah. <laughs> I made some comments, of course, in social media about that as well. I was really nervous. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, if, you know, who knew the deep space network would throw, I think it was actually a comms issue. And it was uh, when they threw a, 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 you know, some, uh, it looked to me like it was just a software issue, to be honest with you. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Keep going. We got, uh, yeah. we got yeah. uh, 20 minutes. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know me, I'm a quickie. Um, we're heading back. So here we go. Let's go. Where are you? Here we are. I personally believe that we we have to get out and and we must be in an analog environment. Um, I think at the moment there are about seven hundred analog astronauts on the planet, approximately that can call, call themselves analog astronauts who have actually been on analog missions. You, you, we, we, you and I both know that 
practice in this environment really does improve on uh, best practices. Uh, if, if we build these environments, we're finding that people are, are showing up. High seas was, a, was you know, in, in past tense, a great example, right? It, it was a brilliant environment. It's unfortunate that they've closed, but, um, but you can go on Airbnb and pick up uh, some time in there if you'd like. Uh, I don't know if they left the spacesuits, but um, yeah, one of the things that I've found interesting about the analog environments is that you know, we really start testing out all the different um, form and function. It really is, is, a great, is a great terminology for that. How are we going to react to regolith that rips through our suits or tears through the bearings in our wheels? And uh, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to build build to prevent that? And as Diallo said yesterday, or Jen said yesterday about Diallo, Professor Wallace, te test before we invest, and uh, that's what we do with analog environments. Um, you know, one of the things I'm working on here in the lab is. Um, hardening these assets so that they are you know better able to perform uh over the long long term right that the long-term missions themselves so that you know we don't die of radiation or we don't kill our plants in these environments and these are all to me very important uh, it does uh, power how are we getting i don't believe i could be wrong but i think um solar so, solar cells on the surface of uh, the moon aren't going to be really terrific unless we have those towers that rotate around and we're up at, uh, you know, either the North or the South pole of the surface of the moon. Uh, otherwise we're going to need those little mini RTGs that was at Lockheed and somebody else came up with the other day. Um, th this is, I'm going to minimize you there. This is, um, um, uh, and these spacesuits at the ILMA, which is the inflatable lunar Mar a Martian analog habitat at the University of North Dakota. And by the way, these are all images that I've either taken or I am in, or uh, I participated in missions that I participated in. So they, these are all, there's no copyright on these, at least from my perspective. Um, this is, um, this is the suit that, um, that Dr. De Leon, Pablo De Leon has uh, developed. It's the, it's a uh, it's a an amazingly authentic lunar suit. Runs at about one atm, one atmosphere, and uh, um, I can tell you it's quite bulky. It's a bit heavy. Um, I know it won't be quite as heavy on the surface of uh, the moon. However, uh, it's it's pretty bulky, and um, I was impressed. He's his technology on that is good, and we also use these really cool. Um, devices that they hang the suit and we enter from the back. It's really neat. Uh, when I was at the um, ILMA, I, I particularly work on the plant in the plant module and on developing uh, plants that will do well in that environment. Um, and hopefully, we can use those plants to uh, develop closed loop ECLIS systems. Uh, in fact, I'm going to ECES leaving tomorrow morning heading up to St. Paul and uh, present that device behind me uh, as a means of, you know, what we're doing to test these, these plants and the, and, and how they're going to respond to these, um, these magnetic fields that don't exist and these near null magnetic fields I and mean, what plants are going to do well in those environments. But one of the really cool things uh, about the, um, about the ILMA is that they do have um, a lot of different modules that we can move in and out of. I'll show you in a second, but the, the, they do have a, a rover and it's a rover that you can hang suits from the back, which is just behind me there on the right. Really cool stuff. Some of my team members, crew members, um, you know, it's a, it's a story program. They've been around quite a while. It, they don't get the uh, the attention maybe that they deserve, but that's probably a good thing because uh, uh, there's more time for me to get in and do my research. Uh, this is Sarah. Sarah was on the mission with me last mission, and she came up with some brilliant concepts on how to uh, to rescue. Uh, if somebody gets in trouble on the surface of the moon, what are we going to do? How are we going to rescue them? What, what devices are we going to use? 
I, some of that's proprietary, so I can't really show you any of those things that she's working on, but um, brilliant ideas. Uh, the second picture just to the right is this device behind me and what I've done, I've, I've created a neuronal magnetic field on the inside of that device. And that uh, is allowing plants to propagate and they are doing quite well. Uh, this is, that's Professor Wallace right there. This is uh, Lori Waters and a lot of, a lot of people on this you know, call and in these videos will probably know her. Terry, Terry, let me interrupt for a second. Yeah. Um, Sarah just said, you have my permission, Terry. So, <laughs> so, she came so up with it. You want, no, you, no, no pressure, but if you want to share <laughs> secrets, I'll, I'll honestly, I, I don't think I can perform that fast, but she came up with um, this sled system. I, I, so how are we going to move? Let's say an astronaut is incapacitated and is not able to move. How are we going to move them on the surface? Uh, she came up and, you know, it's really, it, it's a, it's been around a while, the sled itself, the sled system, but how are we going to physically move this, this person around? And, um, and so because they're incapacitated and it was just brilliant. It's a, it's literally a, a sled. Uh, we would, you know, roll the astronaut onto the sled and then we would just simply move them around. It's not that simple, but, uh, it, it will work. I'm, I'm convinced. And, uh, and I know, uh, a few of my close friends in, uh, and, NASA and a few other places are in ESA are very interested in this device that she's um, she's kind of manipulated for the lunar surface. And we're going to be there very soon. So we need to be ready. Right. Yeah. Um, Sarah's brilliant. Thanks, Sarah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I think there's Can another question. About this? I don't want to I don't want to like blow the, the your process or your slides. or yeah. anything, but, Let's talk it out. Uh, this uh no gravity Air no like, yeah not gravity I, I said that wrong sorry sorry um uh no no uh magnetic, magnetic field yeah field. so that's what i'm thinking is just it's like it's two sets of copper uh horizontally and two vertically and so that isolates and maybe there's a fifth one in there i can't tell maybe i think there is so that isolates the plants so that they're not being influenced by by magnetism i don't have the biology background to know why that should matter so so explain that to me because i don't get that uh, great question i um happy to explain that so it's actually uh th three sets of helmholtz coils you can go and literally buy the two there, there are two pair in the middle there uh, there's a small Pair, and then there's a larger pair. All of these are these are off the shelf. These big pair I, I developed myself. I'm trying to manipulate the magnetic field away from the interior of the environment. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is that one of the things that you and I both know is that we've developed our 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 anatomy, our plants, everything on this earth is developed with a magnetic field protecting us. How are how are we going to? Uh, you know, let's just really goes back to how are human cells going to develop in a near null or a null magnetic field? Right. We're really keen to know that. I'm, we are testing on the biology side. We're testing human tissue that we can buy off the shelf. We're not going in and picking up, you know, a person's tissue and testing it. But we're in that test bed, as you see it right there. Uh, I'm, I'm actually developing a set of coils uh, that are bigger so that I have a larger test bed so I can increase the number of samples that I can test inside there. We, all, we also pulse the field. And the reason we pulse the field is that we want to, uh, when I say pulse, is that we, we're throwing the electromagnetic waves out and away from the interior of the of the field so that you literally on the inside where you see those plants are you almost have what's considered in my opinion uh, about an australian rules football size test bed in there we know that we've got a, a magnetic field that is very close in fact almost identical to the martian magnetic field and and even more so to the lunar surface okay so that, that's what we're preparing ourselves for is in, in the biology, um, biological side. We, we want to be ready to 
take our things with us and see how they'll do um, and, and know how they'll do in a near null magnetic field. So I'm, I've been working on uh, spirulina, which is the, the two tests down to the lower left and in the middle at the bottom, how they'll do in that near null magnetic field. I'm also working on Arabidopsis. I did some uh, tests on a bunch of different leafies. Um, you, you name it, we've tested all of it. Um, some plants are not going to do well. Oddly, tardigrade is not going to do well. People are surprised to hear that. Yeah. Uh, because tardigrade is probably one of the most hardy water bear or probably the hardiest things that we, we have on the surface of the earth. But they've developed here on the surface of the earth, right? We don't know that we're, they're going to be on, uh, on asteroid Ryugu or Bennu or any of those, right? We don't know that because we haven't found them yet. Um, so I'm, yeah, let's see how things will do. Yeah, tardigrade uh, did not respond well uh, on a previous study. Uh, I am going to study them. I'm actually really curious, and I hope I don't. I hope they don't die uh, because that's a brilliant way to get some, you know, uh, calcium on the surface of any other planet. And uh, yeah, so that's great question. Like so yeah, I want to I want to make sure that you connect in with Dr. Edelbrook. Yeah. I mean, you, what you're doing with plants, he's got to figure out for, for people. So yeah, definitely. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll do that offline, but yeah, that's, that's yeah. great. Okay. I, so, I, no, I, I don't, don't want to like, no, no, it, it's okay. We can chat this out. Cause it's just, uh, I'm really, I'm just showing a few images and a bit of detail about um, what I'm working on here. So that's, um, I appreciate the, um, the give and take. Yeah. I, in his entire talk, I'm thinking how, is an embryo going to react, right? Uh, we, we don't know. And I certainly can test that here in this environment. I don't have the IRB. So I am um, uh, technically still a, re a graduate researcher at uh, American Military University. So I would have to get my IRB approved, which sometimes is not that easy. Um, Space for all, my, my, I have three different corporations that I've, um, that I've partnered in and all of them, you know, would be interested in this and in working in this environment. But uh, I still have to get my IRB, my in, what do they call it? Uh, internal review board IRB or something like that. I, I never know the names of all these acronyms. I'm learning as I go. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna go to this next slide. So this is the ILMA as it is. It's a spectacular facility. It's a research lab. It is developed um, with the horizontal rocket bodies that, you, that we might have uh, if we land horizontally, which it looks like we may. Um, certainly we can you know, probably lift and lower these onto the surface of uh, whatever planetary body we're on and, and put them in a horizontal fashion. Um, and I, I'm hoping that that's where we get, but th there's the Rover in the back. There's a little tunnel that connects to the core module. This is where we sleep, where we eat, where we meet. This is where Capcom is. And, uh, uh so a lot of our time is spent in the core module when we're on that, um, uh, in that facility. I've, I've had, I've got 25 days in the facility, uh, removed from the planet earth. Uh, I spent most of my time in the greenhouse module. Uh, I do exercise practically every day. Some days I would do every other day, depending on how tired I was, because when we go out into the EVA, um, the EVA, putting that suit on, that's hard work. And that's, um, you know, it's difficult. It's, it's not easy uh, to carry that suit around and perform some of those uh, EVA operations that, uh, uh, that Sarah and I had to do, and then I had to do with uh, several of my other partners and, and colleagues. Uh, the geology module, I spent quite a bit of time in mission one in there testing out uh, our, uh, you know, our different plants, seeing how they're doing. And there was a really brilliant microscope. That I just picked up a copy of that microscope here and use. It's uh, very important. And then we were testing soils in there as well. That's a really neat facility. Now, you know, they were NASA funded. I don't know if you know that. They, they received two, UND received two NASA grants, uh, both to about 750,000 each. Oh, fantastic. No, I didn't know that. 
Yeah, uh, over the years. So I, I, what I'm doing in the research side, I'm testing the regolith, uh, this uh, MGS-1S that you get from Exolith Labs, um, which I highly recommend in terms of the, um, the chemical properties of Exolith. Um, you know, it's, it's brilliant. They've, they've done, uh, um, an amazing job at really replicating what, what we know is on the surface of, of the moon. And they've done a, a terrific job at that. Uh, here in the lab, I'm, I'm working on understanding how the DNA, of particularly the spirulina is changing as I, as I add to the, the medium that I'm feeding the spirulina and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand if there we're getting any, uh, changes and, and understanding kind of the omics of, or the changes in, uh, spirulina. I, I, it's actually arthrospira platensis. If you want to really throw the, the technical terms around I'm seeing if it changes, you know, and, and as I mix this, regolith into it as a feedstock. And so that's a really cool thing that we're doing here. By the way, I have an employee. I have um, uh, one intern, kind of like you, right? You, you need help in this environment. And um, they've been spectacular. Um, form of uh, some of the other studies, go ahead. What about this, this habitat design, layout, flow? Like, um, I mean, the picture you just showed a moment ago seemed pretty strict somewhat rigid so it's not like yeah choices here yeah they're rigid um they're rigid body they're um is the is the core module is that inflatable it is an inflatable yeah and they he keeps uh dr de leon keeps that and then he has travis nelson who's kind of the runs the entire show there uh they keep it at one atm they don't go any higher than that uh but we do get fresh air in there although i have to say we we were maybe a bit overly cautious with CO2 as, a, as its concentrations do kind of increase and decrease throughout the day. Um, we were watching it closely and, and I, I can't really show you the inside of the facility, but we were watching it closely um, in, in, in our sleeping modules. So we have literally, it's a little module that we sleep in. Mm -hmm. you know, just keeping an eye on it. You know, it, it. Definitely something to pay attention to, but. Uh, we do get fresh air in there, thankfully. And they have a toilet and a shower. Anyway, um, form and function, we really pay attention on that with the facility itself. And how, how, do, how do humans respond in there? Or does, is, it, is it safe? There, are there um, you know, any potential dangers lurking, right? Stairwells, or uh, there are no stairwells other than in and out of the modules themselves. But uh, paying close attention to uh, uh, the work study, right, and, and how we can go from point A to point B, and you know, is there you know any issues at all? I I I did a really cool thing. I did some lighting on the inside. It's brilliant, really pretty. I just like to change things up a little when I'm there. I I because I find that you know lighting to me is a very important function. Uh, learning that from the real estate career. Oh sure. Um, we did a lot of little isolation studies. We do a bunch of uh, psychological studies with respect to being isolated for that length of time. Jen mentioned it yesterday um, as part of his um, um, MD MDRS. You know, there is a third quarter syndrome and it has hit in both missions that I've had there, literally almost to the hour, third wow. quarter. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. You're like, oh my God, you, you really just think, I could stay longer, but I really want to get home, but I could right. stay longer. You know? Yeah. It's, it's amazing. You know, and I know you know this, but because you and I've talked about it, when I'm in there, I can actually focus on my work. I can actually pay attention to my study. When I'm here in the lab, I, you know, I've got people in and out, um, right. kids, family responsibility. So it's, it's definitely, um, you know, it's, it's much easier to focus away from uh, all those distractions. Um, we also did some energy and nu nutrition studies. Um, Keith Pierce, um, by the way, on uh, mission two, uh, all military, except for myself, um, and active, active duty military. So <laughs> a 
active duty military. Yeah. And talk about uh, folks. Right. That- we, we have one minute. You have to finish a one minute story on how did active duty get uh, PCS orders to they, do they a have to ask well in advance <laughs> is that i mean is it space force because you're about like you're making my heart heart heartbeat a little faster here yeah uh across the board we've got represent representation literally on all on all sides so anyway um lunar dust super you know relevant to us and you and i and people up there and how that's going to affect the spacesuits and um yeah there we could we could talk forever. Um, I'm working on for my thesis, um, my PhD, I'm working on lunar concrete for protection of uh, the habitats themselves. And uh, I was going to show you that, but I won't. It's really cool. I can share my slides later with everyone. Yeah. And, and uh, post the link. Yeah, do that. Yeah. And then we do have to switch to our next speaker. Yeah, no worries. Um, but there you are. That's it. We've got, uh, I love that video. I love that video. Yeah, it's brilliant. All right. There's so much that could have gone wrong there. I mean, there's <laughs> so much. It's uh, it, like I don't use the word miracle very often, especially around sciencey stuff, but oh. it's a miracle we didn't kill anybody. Nobody died. <laughs> yeah, it's a miracle. Yeah. All right, sir. We can keep going. I want to oh. definitely hook you in with, uh, with Egbert. I think there's some synergy there. Um, and I will connect with you early next week. Thanks a lot, Terry. Appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Right on. All right. Bye-bye. Bye Bye now. And uh, Sarah, um, she's posting that, uh, no, we were students, so I'm assuming she's saying that she was, is a military officer, that they took leave, not acting in their official capacity. Super important to hear that. Still want to hear your story. Definitely going to follow up with you, Sarah. Thank you. Please send me a message. Um, that is awesome. I was curious about that. Cool. Um, all right, Terry, thanks a lot, sir. Appreciate it. We're going to move on to our next, uh, I'll talk to you next week and I am going to not demote you. I'm just going to move you to the attendees. I'm right here. All right. Uh, whoops, whoops. Where is, just a minute, let me get my schedule up here. Casey Casey is our last speaker of the day. And I do not see her in the program. She has communicated that she's on her way. Give me 10 seconds here. Let me just check messages. Okay, 45 minutes ago, she said she was going to be here, but she is not in the call. So I'm going to take a few minutes, tap dance for a moment, see if we can get her. Um, Send a message to, thank you. Um, I'm just scanning the the people here. Okay, so I'm going to spend a few minutes and... um, and kind of showcase what's coming up. Uh, Terry, if we need to, I'll bring you back in, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold off for just a second. Um, so we've been doing this, I said earlier today, uh, this is either our 24th or 25th event. We have two more coming up immediately. One is working with the uh, Moon Society on their Lunar Development Conference. And the other is, um, uh, a crypto commu- cryptocurrency community focused on Mars called MarsCoin. Both fascinating organizations. We really want to help them out as best we can. Um, so those are coming up. And I see Casey's here, so I'll, let, I'll promote you just right now. Yep. Okay, great. 
Uh, so we've got these two events coming up on the 20th and 23rd for the Winter Development Conference. Uh, so please check out um, the uh, marssociety.org Lunar Development Conference. And then Mars Coin. I think Mars Coin is fascinating. And, and full disclosure, I have like $400 worth of Mars Coin. So I don't have a lot. So I'm not like going crazy with that. Um, but full disclosure, I do think it's a neat uh, tool. They are planning for the future of Mars that has a million people. And I think that is brilliant and optimistic and beautiful all at the same time. It might be a little premature, but it might not be. So um, what I did of my own due diligence was I did figure out that um, through them, I learned uh, that Mars coin is the only coin that's backed by physics. And I think that is a fascinating, interesting idea. So if you believe that Mars will eventually have a million people or more, that they will eventually have an economy, might want to take a look at the expo that we're hosting at the end of the month in July. So check back on our website, uh, betterfutures.space for more information about these two upcoming events. And then we have a third event uh, at the end of August, which is called Dare Greatly. And that one is on the finance, operations, money, and capitalization of space. So here we got uh, 200 and, sorry, uh, 200, nearly $250 billion have moved into this industry over the last 15 years. Most of it has happened in the last five. Uh, it's a global phenomenon. There's, this is a new economy that's never really been tracked before. Uh, some estimates put it at about 400, 450 billion dollars per year in revenue. Uh, that's bigger than most nations of the world. And there's no conference that really tackles the money of space. So we're going to be hosting that event starting at the end of uh, end of uh, August, and we'll be hosting that as a quarterly program. Uh, to keep everybody up to speed. So that's kind of what we're doing. Um, we're going to keep up this uh, living in space series of going to the moon, going to Mars and building out space stations. So stick with us, check out betterfutures.space for more information. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Casey. I'm going to introduce you. Casey, can you turn on your camera, please? And give me a sound check. Hey. Hello. Can you hear oh, me? Yep. Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, great. Perfect. Let me get your bio here. Um, uh, she's with Purdue Mars and the Mars Society. Uh, Casey was a previous crew commander and engineer at the Mars Desert Research Station, a space analog facility that, that supports Earth-based re research for human space exploration. Her areas of specialty are chemistry and space exploration, which were utilized for research and out outreach projects, including compost feasibility, waste analysis, and a Martian cookbook. That sounds super fun. I can't wait to chat with you. Uh, as a preface, uh, Casey, I, um, I don't, I've been to Mar MDRS, I've been to MDRS twice, but as a, as a tourist, I brought some okay. equipment out there for, a, for an experiment. As I told uh, uh, James Burke, the executive director of the Mars Society uh, several times, this is a completely new topic to me. I, even though I've been in space for 20 years as an industry, I don't know this at all. So I'm really, I've been really excited. I've, I, took, uh, I took a dozen pages of notes yesterday. So I'm gonna do that while you're talking. So I am paying attention, but I'm also taking notes, okay? Okay, sounds right. good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, that's exciting to hear also because I want to share just kind of like what a cruise experience is like and kind of what that taught me and how that kind of gave me a foot in the door of kind of this like broader field of space exploration mm -hmm. um, and living in space. So um, I'm happy to like explain what that's like for you. Awesome. Um, yeah. So like you said, my name is Casey Hilton. Um, I'm an analog astronaut who was part of two MDRS missions. Um, one was Crew 202 and the other was Crew 236. Um, and so Purdue, I'm part of Purdue Mars, which is the Purdue 
chapter of the Mars Society. Um, and Purdue, along with a few other colleges, kind of have like these regular rotations at the station. Um, so basically they've come, they've had a rotation and they have proven that the research that they do um, and how they work is um, good enough to basically have a spot on more than one rotation and kind of have regular rotations through the year. Um, and so that's a great honor that Purdue has. And so that's how I got connected to MDRS um, and all that stuff. So I've actually experienced MDRS three times, um, two times as part of a crew, and then once as a visitor, kind of like you were. Um, and so I'm really excited to share what living in space is like from this cruise perspective. Um, kind of like I said, things I learned along the way and what I look forward to seeing um, the future of living in space and space exploration being and what it looks like for humans to be in space. Um, so from a very young age, I loved chemistry. I grew up loving cooking shows and I realized much later in life that I really only really liked them because they contained chemistry inside of them. And I didn't want to be a chef at all. I was like, I want to be a chef. And then I realized like, oh, no, 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 no. I like the chemistry aspect. So I ended up at Purdue University um, studying chemistry. I got involved with multiple different space clubs and programs at Purdue, which then led me to be part of Purdue Mars. Um, and through that, my knowledge of space went from just something that I thought was fun and was very curious about um, really, really expanded to um, what the current state of space exploration is like. And so through that, um, I've had the opportunity to listen to the chief engineer of the Perseverance rover talk, kind of give a presentation what they expect that whole mission to be like. Um, back in 2018, he came and spoke. Um, I've gotten to listen to a spacesuit engineer present what you know, the future of spacesuits looks like, especially being on Mars. Um, network with some of the most amazing people, including people, I mean, here, the Mars Society throughout Purdue, um, and then go to the Mars Desert Research Station. So basically in 2019, excuse me, 2018, I filled out an application form to go to MDRS and was emailed by the commander of Crew 202 um, and asked if I'd be crew engineer. And... So I have, this was a second rotation. There was one the year before, and this kind of helped solidify Purdue's um, place in the rotations at MDRS. Um, and so as crew engineer, my job was to fix things and keep the functioning, the station functioning properly. So keep tabs on water, electricity, solar panels, rovers. I mean, anything that goes with the functioning of the station was my job. Um, I have a background in welding. I'm a certified welder and then um, also a little bit in engineering as well. So for me, that was a great fit for that role. And so um, that was from that role, that is like what the responsibility was. And so the crews each then have different roles. So there's commander, executive officer, crew engineer, green hab officer. Everyone's kind of got their own little job that they've got to do to keep the station and the crew, um, healthy functioning, doing what they um, need to do to work towards the goal of research um, and kind of completing this rotation that we have to hopefully help put people on Mars. Like that's why we're there. So during this rotation, um, everyone also then had their own research projects. So mine, you kind of said this earlier, but mine centered around waste analysis and compost feasibility. Um, on the station, there is a greenhouse, kind of like we would expect also to be on Mars um, or anywhere that we would go in space, having a greenhouse um, or some place to be able to grow plants is really helpful. Um, so basically my research was about like, do we produce the proper waste to have um, a good compost mix. So compost kind of takes a certain percentage of carbon-based things and nitrogen-based things. Um, so you have like uh, food waste and then you would have things like paper. So you kind of have to have a good mix of things in order for it to be good to help fertilize plants. Um, so uh, analyzing the waste on the station from um, burnable, non-burnable, what's recyclable, what could be reused in the station, what couldn't be reused, um, what could be composted, what couldn't be composted, what is just plain trash that we would have to get rid of. 
um, human waste as well, which kind of turn into um, something entertaining for us to keep logs um, kind of turned into a game for us. And so then analyzing all that to figure out like, do, does the station or what we would expect crews going to Mars um, produce the proper amount of waste to get this good mixture of compost? So anyways, that was what my um, research um, focused around. And so this experience of being at Purdue as crew engineer, this is what really solidified that love of like space, um, space exploration and my desire to get humans to live and explore space. Um, as a chemist, at least in my college experience, um, I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry. There really isn't a lot of intersection of chemistry and space. So the only um, exposure that I got to space was when I sought it out myself. And I went to Purdue, which is pretty big in space. So if that's the case for me, then I can imagine, you know, I can't speak for other places, but I can imagine that um, that's a shared experience with other people. And so, you know, everyone that you meet at the Mars um, MDRS or Purdue Mars, a lot of them are aerospace engineers or planetary scientists. And so for me to take part as a chemist felt like a completely different experience. So I had different knowledge, I had a different background, kind of a different perspective. And so it was a whole different experience for me. And I left the station understanding that there was a place for me and there was a place for people like me and people who don't do aerospace engineering or planetary science. Nothing wrong with them, but I understood like, oh, wow, there's this whole um, other side to space exploration that is open to people who are chemists, who are botanists, who are biologists who are um, writers and artists. I mean, there's a bunch of different roles there. And so it really opened my eyes to seeing that, you know, like living in space and getting people to space is not just the role of aerospace engineers and planetary scientists. It kind of takes everyone. Um, so that was a huge revelation for me. Um, at the beginning of 2020, I visited MDRS again as a visitor, kind of like you did, um, but I got to see the next Purdue rotation. So the one after me was there. And so I was kind of able to see from a mission control perspective, an outsider's perspective, but looking in, um, what does the functioning of an analog site like MDRS take? And what does it look like? And how, um, what does the staff and the, the employees do to make it function and all that stuff that goes into it. And so that was just really interesting um, to see kind of both sides of the coins, like what research is being done in there as if we're on Mars, and then what kind of research and uh, what roles it takes to then make these things function, and kind of like the two sides of the coins of getting people to live in space. Um, so that was really helpful. Shortly after, I was asked to be commander of then the following crew, um, which was one of the greatest honors I've ever had. I mean, this felt like a huge step in um, like the path of growth for not only Purdue crews, um, MDRS, but just kind of space exploration in general, however small that kind of might have been. But for me, it felt huge because now someone who was like me, who I felt um, who's not maybe like a conventional, has a conventional background um, within these crews or within the field of space, was I was now given this opportunity to be a commander, which was huge. Um, so not only that, but I was the first woman commander of a Purdue crew. And oh. then I also was the youngest by a significant amount of years. And so it was just a huge honor to be able to do that. And also like, what does my background, um, how does that change how we do research? And um, how does that change the kind of like experience or things that we do to put people on Mars, like what new perspective does that bring? Um, and so having that opportunity, I also wanted to give it to other people who were like myself. Um, I wanted to be able to give people who maybe felt like they didn't have an intersection of whatever they loved in space. I wanted to give them a foot in the door um, to be able to explore this and solidify their passion and their love for space exploration, which then helps everybody get there. Um, 
And so I wanted to give people of different educational, cultural, racial, and gender backgrounds a place in space as well, like I was given. And I kind of said this earlier, but a feat like getting to Mars or just space in general, getting to the moon, to Mars and beyond and living there is done with everyone. And so it really felt important to include um, as diverse of a crew as possible in as many ways as possible. So the 2020 and the 2021 field season that we were supposed to be a part of got delayed due to COVID, uh, which is not, it happened a lot. And so, else, yep. Right. It was the necessary steps we had to take. And so that also brought changes to my crew. I had picked a crew who I felt like really represented um, the diversity that I wanted in a bunch of different ways that I wanted. But unfortunately with the crew being a lot of college students or recent graduates, um, they just were not able to meet either the financial responsibilities or the time it would take to be a crew member. And so that meant I had to really quickly shuffle and reassemble, pull alternates. If those alternates no longer worked, I then had to interview new people. It was this really big shuffle of trying to make this crew work and be able to go and have a productive experience to do really good research and to be a part of this station again. Let me interrupt with a question. Was this a two week mission, a three week mission? It was two. Yeah. Two weeks. A okay. two week. Yeah. Yeah. You got to have people that you can spend two weeks with. Yes. And especially people who it's like, okay, I trust that you're going to do your job. I trust you've got good research, people that you can really rely on. Um, but it's kind of funny because isn't that just how it is in real life with space exploration and going to space? So even looking at Apollo 13 and how Jack Swigert is put in as a replacement at the very last minute, um, that's just how it has to go sometimes, especially within this field. And so it was really encouraging to me and the remaining crew members and even the new ones of like, okay, well, if we were astronauts and we were going to Mars, like, how do we do this well? How would we do this in real life and work as real astronauts in this way of being able to make things work being able to shuffle things around last minute, kind of do things on the fly um, and that are necessary and do them well. And so this is kind of something that crew 236, this crew that I was the commander of, what we like to call Martian boys making do. Boys in this case mean men, men women, any person. Um, but we were constantly throwing that phrase around because while you're there, um, you know, there's a communication lag, things break, you're kind of on your own, um, even in terms of what are we gonna make? What are we gonna do? How are we gonna make things work? Um, anything new that was thrown our way, we would always use the phrase Martian boys make do because um, that's what it's like living in space. And so living in space, it takes troubleshooting and figuring out hard stuff, but it's really vital. And that's a huge you know, component of what it's like to live in space. And so although I felt like we did lose some diversity on that crew in some ways, I really felt like we gained it in others. And so Martian boys make do, you know, that's, that's what you got. That's what you got to do. And it was great. So um, in December of 2021, um, the crew finally made it to MDRS after about two years of putting it together, having it delayed and then doing another one. We finally made it there. It was amazing. Um, and this experience was completely different than the first one that I had as crew engineer. So, I mean, this was my crew. This was my crew. I put them together. I was responsible for what they did. I was the one that had to answer to mission control if something went wrong. I was the one that had to answer to um, the employees of the Mars Society. I mean, it was completely different for me. And so I had to give over my responsibilities and tasks to other people and be able to trust them to do their jobs correctly. The jobs that you know I interviewed them for, that they have the background for, I had to give up control and let the people who were yep. kind of like specialists, if you wanna call them that, do their thing. Yep. Um, and so that was a really, that was definitely a harder lesson to learn is to give up that control <laughs> and let people who are better at these things do their thing. Yeah, um, but- That's a lesson we all need. By the yeah. Way. yeah. And that's so important, especially living. I've said this a million times, but living in space, putting people in space, whether it's the moon, Mars, beyond putting um, rovers or telescopes in space, like that's what it takes is, okay, like 
I have to give up my own control to people who know what they're doing. Um, so although that was a difficult lesson, it was super important um, and it was really helpful. And so it was my responsibility to then keep my crew accountable within their own jobs. So there was updating them on the status of certain tasks or giving them timelines um, or even having to have one-on-one -on -one talks with crew members to solve problems. It was important to keep everyone working together and working towards the common goal of living in space and completing research projects. Um, another difficult thing I had to learn was how to confront crew members um, when expectations weren't met. And so it was things kind of like, how do we approach a problem with the goal of resolution instead of fighting? How do we approach um, the problem ver like from the perspective of us versus the problem versus us versus each other? Um, how do I stand up for what is right and what our goal is, but not people please? Um, kind of all these questions of like, okay, how do we navigate, especially in a very limited environment, like living at MDRS or what we would expect um, living on the moon, living on Mars or in a kind of like a spaceship, like how do we go through these things? Cause you can't really just leave. No. <laughs> um, and so this is something that I had to do a few times and that, that lesson that I had to learn, I was really proud of um, having issues being resolved and new perspectives being brought in and having the crew continue to work together as a well-functioning team. Um, I'm proud of myself for doing that, but also for other crew members having the ability to, like I said, have that perspective of the crew versus the problem versus fighting with each other. Um, and so that was another lesson that was hard to learn, but so important um, within the context of living with each other for two weeks um, in SIM. So my focus within this crew um, was more outreach projects, whereas before it was waste um, analysis and compost feasibility. I took the role of more outreach um, as well as overseeing the other research projects done by the crew members. So we did a Q&A with a local third grade class to educate children about space and what living in space looks like. Um, some of their questions were just the best. Like, can you deliver pizza? Um, can you make sand castles? So those are kind of the more um, silly, funny ones, but some of them had really good questions of, you know, how much air is in your helmet? How can you go outside? What is the air like? Uh, what is gravity like? How do you use the restroom? How do these things work? Can you go to the grocery store? Which then lead to really good conversations about the difference of life in space versus on earth. Um, especially we were in Mars, so our answers were more Mars-based, but some of them had to do with the moon or space in general. So educating um, them about those things was awesome. They had great questions for third graders. Like, I don't think I could have come up with some of those. <laughs> I love yeah. uh, I love working with, uh, there's a sixth grade class that I, that I talk to pretty often. It's so mm -hmm. much fun. Yeah. yeah. Some of them are so intelligent. Like they would be like, oh, well, what about this constellation and this rover? And I was like, I only knew about that the last few years. And you're like six <laughs> or seven and you know all of these things. Yeah. It's yeah, amazing. It's remarkable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was a really fun one. Um, the other outreach project was a Martian cookbook, kind of like you had talked about. Um, and so while you're at MDRS or on Mars, or on the moon, I guess anywhere in space, you have very limited resources. Um, so things like you don't, you can't go to the grocery store, you can't order food, you have to um, eat and make what you have at the station. And so using what was available to us at MDRS, I wanted to create a cookbook so that crews coming to the red planet or coming to MDRS could have their own little taste of earth kind of their own little taste of home. And so this cookbook had a bunch of different recipes from different countries, different cultures, um, with the goal of people coming to MDRS and being able to find something that is similar to their home. So people come from all over the world to yeah. MDRS um, or any other analog site. And being in the United States, you know, food is available that is common in the United States. 
um, in other food that is common in other places might not be available there. So I really wanted to be able to um, make a cookbook that used what we had and kind of give everyone their own little flavor or little piece of home, um, regardless of where you came from or how you, where you ended up, whether it was at MDRS or FMARS or any other analog site, like that's what I really wanted to do. And so uh, we did that. We had a few different crew members from different places. One is from Russia and has a Jewish background. And then another one is from India. One is Italian. And so kind of using some of their perspectives and then also bringing in other ones that we had brainstormed beforehand. Um, we put this cookbook together um, and it's in its final edit right now. Hopefully will be available really soon. I think the edits will be done within hopefully the next week or two, um, just kind of like cleaning it up a little bit, is, making is sure that, it's easy to read. Are you saying you're using food that you brought with you, kind of prepackaged food that you can make it, spice it so it's like, so it's Italian? I, I don't, I, or is this a global cookbook because it's, you know, stuff that we're going to take with us when we go to Mars? So the cookbook is based around the supplies that you were given while you're at MDRS. Okay. All so right. when you get there, every crew has just a stock of food yeah. that is already there. And yes. And so um, there's different ingredients. A lot of them are freeze dried things. And so um, they're not like MREs. They're actually like food shelf stable food and ingredients. So yeah. you cook together like in a normal kitchen and so using those things provided that are provided to every crew, how can we then make different dishes that are um, available different that's, places? That's brilliant. I love so that. It, it was so fun. Like our crewmate who was Italian, he grew up in Italy, I think for the first, or he was in Italy for the first 25 years of his life. And so we would kind of have to dig around and find what was in the inventory for him to then make you know, his favorite Italian dish or something similar with what was available. Um, and so since that was available to us, it'll be able available to future crews. So then they can recreate the same things. So as we wrap up here, uh, your initial love for cooking got you to chemistry, got uh -huh. you to Mars, got you back to cooking. That, that I... I had never even pieced that together. That's hilarious. No. That was, <laughs> that's amazing. It did. It really did. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. I love yeah. that. I mean, we all get bit by the space bug one way or another. Like mm -hmm. we all, like mine is, mine is more kind of a traditional path with fiction, but that is fantastic. Cooking led to chemistry. Chemistry mm -hmm. led to Purdue. Yeah. Purdue led to Mars. Mars led to cooking. Mm -hmm astounding that's hilarious i did not realize we came full circle <laughs> but here i am <laughs> there you are fantastic casey yeah. it's really been terrific uh talking to you today we do have to wrap up um right. let's stay in touch uh what's what's next are you in a different program at purdue or what are you doing um i graduated in 2019 so um i currently live in georgia i actually work for a medical device company and specialize in epilepsy so it's kind of off uh mm -hmm. not quite space exploration um, but it's definitely something that I like to keep up with kind of as a hobby or when I can and try to get, um, back to it whenever I can and if opportunities are available. So. Awesome. Last yeah. question, short mm -hmm. answer. Purdue is doing regular, uh, crew rotations out there. Is there one kind of experiment that's a through line that everybody participates in or do they all bring their own thing? They just have a good organization at Purdue, which, which how do they operate? Um, normally everybody kind of has their own individual ones. Some crew members have been there multiple years. So there has been one running every year that Purdue has been there, but that was because that person was there and other people helped take part. Um, okay. but everyone brings their own individual ones. That's awesome. All right. Thanks a lot, Casey. Appreciate yeah, thanks it. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, everybody. We're going to close down for the week, uh, the weekend, um, I hope everybody enjoyed this. This was certainly a lot of fun for us. I want to especially thank um, our, our partners in developing this. Um, 
the science fiction community of Axonar, the technical community of uh, the Mars Society. We, we absolutely could not have done this without the Mars Society for this event. So super, super, super thanks to, to Dr. Rupert, Dr. Zubrin, and, and of course to James, James Burke. Um, all of their people that they that they corralled to bring to this event, um, Casey, Mark, uh, Jen, um, Anastasia, and uh, and of course to our own team. Um, uh, it was really great having uh, Laura Forsick to come in and give us some analysis and evaluation. And last but maybe maybe most important i i really love the people who came here and joined as participants and attendees and watching us on the on the various youtube channels um and my my you know heartfelt thanks to my team uh Gion and youngin who are leaving back uh their their state department program is ending um in the next couple of weeks so they won't be on the program again so thanks for them and to uh, Fabio and Yusuf to run my technical side and to my three newest people on my team, uh, David, Leah, and uh, Joey. Um, it's really going to be great having you uh, join the, the program. So thanks a lot, y'all. Appreciate it. And see you next month. Or no, please come to our event in July 20th and 23rd with the Moon Society, our event on the 30th with Mars Coin. And our event next month with the uh, Space Finance and Investment Program. All right. You can find all that information at betterfutures.space. And with that, I'm out. Thanks a lot, y'all. Bye-bye.